Welcome to a Fiway Excellence Without Stress. Welcome, guys, to a Fiway Excellence Without Stress. And in today's study, we are going to be looking at organic chemistry. Now, organic chemistry is simply defined as the study of carbon compounds. But then, not all carbon compounds are organic. What are the examples or the list of carbon compounds that are not considered organic? You have your oxides of carbon. So your oxides of carbon, for instance, carbon 4 oxide, which is CO2, and carbon 2 oxide, which is CO, these are not organic. You have your carbonate salts and your bicarbonate salts. So carbonate salts or bicarbonate salts. So when I consider your carbonate salts, you are looking at salts that contain CO3 to minus, so calcium carbonate, sodium carbonate, and the rest of them. Then your bicarbonate salt, your sodium bicarbonate, that is sodium hydrogen trioxocarbonate 4. These salts are not considered as organic. The other set of carbon compounds that are not considered organic are your carbonate acid. So that is your trioxocarbonate 4 acid. It is not considered an organic molecule. So when you have your H2CO3 uh, triosocarbonate 4 acid, it is not organic. So these are the examples or list of compounds that are not considered organic. However, every other compound or most other compounds that are carbon related are referred to as organic compounds. Now, with this said, we move ahead. This definition goes wider in scope than the previous limited definition that organic chemistry applies only to the study of plants or substances of plants and animal origin. No, when you are talking about organic compounds, it's not just things that are produced from plants and animals. This is because most of the substances from living organisms can also be synthesized from inorganic materials in the lab. The presence of many organic compounds is due to the ability of carbon to do the following things. First off, we have the ability of carbon to catenate. When you talk about catenation, it is the ability of a particular atom of an element to combine with another atom of the same element to form straight chains. So these chains can be branched, they can be straight, they can be ring shaped, and so on and so forth. Carbon also has the ability to combine with hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and other halogens. They also form single, double, triple covalent bonds. What then do we consider as the general characteristics of organic compounds? First of all, flammability. Most organic compounds have the ability to be combustible and when they burn, in most cases, they are going to produce carbon four oxide and water. They also have low melting and boiling point as a result of the weak intermolecular force of attraction between the atoms of the organic compound. There is also the state of covalency. Carbon atoms of organic compounds form stable covalent bonds with one another. So when you are asked what type of bond is formed in organic compounds, it is simply covalent and those covalent bonds are stable. As such, they do not ionize in solutions and are never considered as conductors of electricity or neither can they be used as electrolytes. So moving ahead, the other thing about them is that they are thermally instable. Most organic compounds or some organic compounds decompose into simpler fractions when you heat them above temperatures of 500 degrees Celsius. Hence, they are unstable in the presence of high temperature. So you have things like your, um, so when you consider things like your, your petroleum or yes, your petroleum fractions or distillates, some of them undergo cracking to produce lower um, carbon chains. Again. And basically, this is simply because of the fact that it's an organic compound and it is unstable in the presence of high heat. So once there is high temperature, automatically it breaks the substance down. Reactivity. Reactions involving organic compounds tend to be slower compared to inorganic compounds. And with that said, we have come to the end of the general properties of an organic compound. Functional groups are basically atoms, radicals, or a bond common to a homologous series. I would refer to them as the part of an organic compound that characterizes that organic compound. Yes. And these functional groups could range from different elements occurring or a particular type of bond. 
Alkanes, for instance, are hydrocarbons that only possess single bonds. That's why you have this. Your haloalkanes have the halides as their functional group. Alkanols have hydroxyl uh, as hydroxyl group as their functional group. Your ethers are basically compounds that have oxygen as their functional group. And what exactly do I mean by that? If you are considering your ether, you are looking at a compound that has alkyl attached to oxygen attached to alkyl. So this is basically what your ether looks like. Oxygen is the functional group in this case. Moving ahead, your alkanals are characterized by carbonyl group. The thing about alkanals is both alkanals and alkanones are characterized by carbonyl group. But the difference between alkanals and alkanones is that in the case of alkanals, the carbonyl group, which is C double bond oxygen, is terminal. While when you are dealing with your alkanones, the carbonyl group, which is C double bond O, is non terminal. So to help us understand this or to betray this point the more, let's consider these two structures. If you look at this structure, where the carbonyl group is at a non-terminal carbon. Ca terminal carbon is a carbon that occurs at the end. So we'll have this. And then you consider another organic compound with a carbonyl group. But this time around, it occurs terminally. Which one of them is the alkanal? Which one of them is the, no is the alkanone? The alkanal is the one whose carbonyl group occurs terminally, and that is this one. So this is alkanal. While this other one is your alkanone, because its carbonyl group occurs non-terminally. So if we are to represent them, that's why this case, this one ends with attachment to hydrogen, while this one has a continuation to another alkyl group. The next one we are going to consider is the alkanoic acid, which possess the carboxylic group as their functional group. Then we have your esters, which basically have the carboxylate group. Your amines have NH2. Your amides have NH2 attached to the carbonyl group. And then you have your nitriles, which have a triple bond between carbon and nitrogen. Now, the amine group is simply a derivative, an organic compound that is derived from ammonia. So I'm going to take this out and explain. Okay, so if I have ammonia, ammonia is NH3. Now, yeah. if I want to form ammonia, sorry, amine, this is ammonia. But ammonia is what is used to form amines, how? When an alkyl group replaces the hydrogen in ammonia, it forms an amine. So which means if I have this particular ammonia and then I replace one of the hydrogens with an alkyl group, this one now is called primary amine. If you replace only one hydrogen with alkyl group, it's primary amine. Okay. Now after the primary amine is formed, you now replace one more. If you replace two of the hydrogens in ammonia by two alkyl groups, what you now have here is called secondary amine. Okay? Then, which means that if, for instance, I now need to replace three of the hydrogens in ammonia with alkyl groups, R, 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 let's call prime, 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 same thing or different things. What is this one now going to refer to us now? Tertiary amine. So, that's that basically. So you find out that the whole groups of amines that are formed or different classes of amines is simply derived from ammonia. If you replace one hydrogen, you have primary. If you replace two, you have secondary. If you replace three, you have tertiary. Now, the next functional group that is of emphasis here is what we refer to as the amide. Now, both the amide and the amines are like sister groups because they both have nitrogen with single bonds. But the difference between an amine and an amide is this. An amide group, an amide group is formed by a combination of carbonyl and amine. So this is carbonyl. If you now attach it to amine, I told you amine is just nitrogen that has single bonds, all three. So with this now, the implication is that if I join these two, what I will get is amide. So your amide group will now be equals nitrogen attached to C double bond O. Then you could have any other thing here. Now also, you could have any other thing here. Now, 
if only one carbon is attached to nitrogen this is going to be referred to that's if you have the carbon of the carbon dioxide attached to nitrogen this one is primary amine if i now have another one where nitrogen is attached to alkyl group you know this like alkyl group has carbon the carbon of the alkyl group is what is attaching so it's not attached to two carbon atoms what will it now become secondary amide then in a scenario where you have nitrogen attached to carbonyl group which is one carbon here then another alkyl group which is two carbons another alkyl group which is three carbons it is going to be referred to as tertiary amide Welcome guys to a few way excellence without stress and in today's study we are going to be considering something very interesting and that is naming alkanes now before we get to naming alkanes it's important that we take note of the fact that every organic name has four major parts and what are those parts the root word the suffixes the prefixes and the infix the arrangement is prefix comes first if there is an infix you introduce it before you get into the root word and then finally your suffixes with this said what is a root word the root word is simply the name of an IUPA compound which indicates the number of carbons in the longest possible continuous carbon chain and this chain is called the parent chain it is actually chosen by a set of rules which will be seen as we go further so that particular name that indicates the number of carbon is called the root word examples of these root words include one for met when you have one carbon is met when you have two carbon is et three is prop four is boot five pens and then as you can see on the screen i'm illustrating this briefly before we continue you will notice something that if we are to consider a particular situation where you have ch3 COOH. You will notice that in this particular compound there are two carbon atoms and automatically these two carbon atoms would indicate ET. Now because of the carboxylic group it's going to be ethanoic acid. You get so just know that why this is ethanoic is because it has two carbon atoms. So take note of that. Now once the parent chain has two carbon atoms it is referred to as um, ET. If it has three it is prop. If it has four it is boot. If it has five, it is pent, and so on and so forth, as you can see on the screen, down to 20. 20 is icos, 21 is any icos, 22 is docos, and the rest of them. Okay, what then is a suffix? The suffix is simply the part of an organic name that indicates its functional group. This is supposed to be a typo, double F. Okay, now, with that said, the implication is that once you are considering a suffix, it indicates the functional group or homologous series of the compound and there are two types of suffixes the first one is the primary suffix the primary suffix is used to indicate the degree of saturation or unsaturation in the main chain it is added immediately after the root word and when we mean degree of saturation or unsaturation please when you say something is saturated or an organic compound is saturated it simply means that there are only single bonds between the carbon atoms so have that in mind once a carbon atom contains only single bonds between the carbon atoms note between the carbon atoms once you notice only single bond between carbon atoms it is said to be saturated on the other hand if there are multiple bonds then you could consider it as unsaturated which means alkenes or alkynes so if you notice if you have single bond between carbon is a double bond e double bond and there are two of them if there are two double bonds is diene if there are three triene four tetraene and so on and so forth if you have a triple bond is ine if you have two triple bonds is diene if you have one double bond and one triple bond is going to be in ine these are basically what the primary suffix entails so if i am to illustrate this um considering our structure on the screen if for instance you notice this particular substance um let's say you have a substance c h three c c and then maybe you have attached to oh okay so we have h here h here 
and then h2 h2 now first of all is the root word is the number of carbon atoms in the parent chain which we have discovered is four and the root word for four as we know is boot then we go to the primary suffix primary suffix because there are only single bonds here this is going to be boot in but let's avoid putting the e why we're not going to put the e is because there is another guy here another functional group that would be indicated and this functional group is what we're going to talk about next before we complete this thing let's consider this now the next type of suffix is known as the secondary suffix it is used to indicate the main functional groups in the organic compound and is added immediately after the first degree suffix first degree suffix is the primary suffix in the IPAC name note if there are two or more functional groups in the compound the functional group with higher priority is to be selected as the main functional group which must be indicated by a secondary suffix the remaining functional groups with lower priorities are treated as substituents and indicated by prefixes the suffixes as well as the prefixes used for some of the important functional groups are shown in the following table in decreasing order of priority so if you look at this now this table is simply telling us how we would name the different um, functional groups when we see them in the compound. Like if you see carboxylic acid, how you will know is by the functional group COOH. And how are you going to represent it in the name? Oic. Which means any compound you notice that ends with oic acid is a carboxylic acid. So have that in mind. However, if I want to represent it as a prefix, I will call it carboxy. If you have your acid and hydride, it is the acidic um, is going to be oic um, and hydride. If you have your ester, we'll refer to them as alkyl, alkanoid. These are the suffixes for each of these guys. But note that when a situation uh, occurs where you have multiple functional groups, the functional group of highest priority is the one that would serve as the suffix, while the one that has a lower priority will now be taken as a prefix. So take note of that. If you, it's not here, right? It's 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 kind of implied here, but you can put it down that the functional group of higher priority serves as the secondary suffix while those of lower priorities would serve as prefixes in a situation where multiple functional groups set to occur. Okay, so you can go through them and see that we have different for the al aldehydes or alkanals, the suffix is al, ketone and the rest of them. Now, we noticed in our diagram OH, which is alcohol, the suffix for alcohol is all. However, if it is occurring as a prefix, it's hydroxy. So, look at what we have here. We've gotten started with the first part, which is the root word, boot. Then we now talked about the primary suffix, which indicates whether it's a single bond, double bond, or triple bond. That's basically what it does. If you notice, only single bond is A. If it's double bond, it's E. If it's triple bond, it's I. But then, in this case, because there are only single bonds, we will not put, we'll put A. But then, if you put the E, and then add the suffix ol it wouldn't look so cool so preferably we would have this as boot in without the e then we now check oh is the major functional group here and we're going to put it as the suffix it represents as all and that's that if you had something like this you will notice something here what are we noticing first of all three carbon atoms the root word is going to be prop only single bonds prop and and then what do we have here carboxylic group the suffix for carboxylic group as we can see is carboxylic group suffix is oic acid so which means you're going to end it with oic acid and that's that basically if you have another situation for instance take let's say maybe you have this compound you have this compound okay so this compound noun h h and h this compound now first of all the root word is prop then it has a double bond, so we are going to have prop E. We are not going to put the E, uh, the other E, because we need to put this. Now, this is a terminal carbonyl, and this terminal carbonyl is for aldehydes. If you look at your aldehydes, your aldehydes are represented by, see them here, so CHO. The suffix, secondary suffix for your aldehyde is R, so which means we are going to have to end this with prop R. Now, as we go further in our naming, we'll find out that we are supposed to indicate the position of this double bond. So the correct name should be prop 2 in now. We'll get to understand this as we go further, but for now, we are concentrating on our canes, and these are the things we need to know 
before we start understanding the naming of any organic compound. Okay, having said this, we move ahead. Now, as I said, that is the function of the secondary suffix. Then we go to the prefix. The prefix is simply used to indicate side chains, substituents, and low priority functional groups. Those are the major things that your prefixes indicate. Um, your side chains are, for instance, your alkyl groups that are not part of the parent chain. We'll see that as we go further in naming. And then you have your substituents, which could be your halides or any other thing. And then if you have multiple functional groups and one of them has a lower priority, the ones that are written as, the ones that are, have lower priority are written as prefixes. But if you have the highest priority, you are going to be written as the secondary suffix. We'll see that as we go further. Now moving ahead, a prefix may precede the word root or infix of the IUPAC name. So it is important to note that the prefix comes first in the IUPAC name. Prefixes used for some common side chains, substituents include CH3 is the methyl, that's the ethyl, the propyl, and so many more we're going to be seeing. With that said, finally, we'll talk about the infix before we get into the rules on them. The infix. Infixes like cyclo, spiro, are simply things that indicate how a particular structure looks. Like the cyclo implies that it is cyclic. So when you see cyclopropane, first of all, we already know that prop, when you hear prop, prop means three. Okay, so when you hear prop, let's take this out. Okay, so as I said, if you hear prop, you have three carbons. Three, one, two, three. And then this is propane if it only has a single bond hydrocarbon, you get. So prop, you have three carbon atoms. So propane will now imply that it is an alkane with three carbon atoms, as you can see here. But in the case of an infix before the propane, if you have cyclopropane, it is simply telling us the shape of this propane, which is cyclic. So have that in mind. If you say spiro, the spiral structure is basically a structure made up of two rings that are joined by one carbon atom. So when you have two rings, and those two rings have a, a common carbon atom joining them, this is what we refer to as the spiral. So this is basically a structure that represents the spiral, where one carbon is joining two different rings. That is the spiral. And all these things that represent how a particular um, structure of an organic compound looks is referred to as the infixes. Now remember, considering the arrangement, let's go back so that we'll consider the arrangement. The arrangement is, first of all, prefix. Prefixes are the ones that are your substituent, your side chains, or lower priority um, functional groups. Infix, if it is necessary. Then root words, and then suffix. If the infix is not necessary, just straight up prefix, root word, suffix. And there are two suffixes. The one that will indicate single, double, and triple bond comes first. That's where you have an, in, or ein. And then the one that indicates the major functional groups comes last. That's where you have your all, oik, nal, and the rest of them. Okay, so for now, we are going to be considering the rules for naming alkanes. First rule, when naming stretching alkanes, unbranched or substituted alkanes, the root word indicating the number of carbon atoms is simply attached to the suffix a. Very simple. What this simply means is this. If, for instance, I have an organic compound and you notice that it is simply a straight chain, there is no branching. For instance, if you look at this, this is straight chain. It can be bent. Have that in mind that it can be bent like this. It can be bent like this. The point is that there is no branching. A branch is an extension. For instance, if you look at this line one, two, and three, and then consider line four. The only branch line here is line four. Why? There's an extension from the continuous flow. This is continuous. This is continuous though it is bent. This is continuous though it is zigzag. But this one has a continuous straight line, but then it has an extension. So have that in mind that when I say branched, it means an extension. So if I have this, this is straight chain. If I have this, this is still straight chain. But once I notice an extension from a continuous flow, that becomes branched. Anyway, for this first rule, we are considering unbranched alkanes. So your unbranched, unsubstituted, or straight chain alkanes simply count the number of carbon atoms there. After counting the number of carbon atoms, what do you do? You check for the, in, the root word. The root word for five in this case is pent. Then what did they say we should simply attach it to? Attach it to the suffix a and a. And that's that, basically. 
and that's how to name it pentane once it is straight chain just count the number of carbon atoms check for the root word and then attach a and e to it and you have your answer okay now with that said we'll go to the second rule the second rule says if the compound is branched first identify the parent chain which is the longest chain of carbon atoms okay so note um, now, the first thing you are going to do if it is branched is to find the parent chain. Now, let's consider a branched chain. Remember, alkanes only have single bonds and they only possess hydrocarbons. So, let's look at this. If you have this, for instance. So, we are going to simply count from N to N to determine which of them is the longest you get. And that's basically what we are going to do. So, if you count from this N to this end, you have one, two, three. We can put our hydrogens. Carbon forms four bonds. So when you have one, the remaining would actually determine the hydrogen surrounding it. So this is one, so three more. This is one, two. So which means we're going to have two more to make it four. This is two, remaining two. This is one, two, remaining two. This is one, two, remaining. Okay, no, that's not two. So if you notice in this case now, this is one, two, three. So it remains only one to make it four. Here you have one, two, so remaining two. Here you have one, two, so remaining two for this guy. Here you have one, so how many more will make it four? Three. So here you have one, two. So here we need two more. We need two more here, two more here, two more here, and then three more here. So that's that basically. Now, if we are to name this compound, it's going to be very simple. How? Count from end to end and find which one is the longest chain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have eight. Then if I count from this end to this end, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine. Let me now come from this end to this end and then check for the longest. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So amongst the terminals I counted, you will notice that the one that is the longest continuous chain is this particular one going like this. So have that in mind that before you choose a parent chain, it must not be the straight one. It can be the bent one, but just make sure it is continuous. Once you come from an end to an end, check for the longest one. And that will become your parent chain. Okay, so rule number two. Yeah, sorry, I meant rule number three. If multiple longest chains occur, the chain with the most substituent becomes the parent chain. Okay, now, um, before we continue, um, it's important that we name this parent chain before we come to this rule. So let's name this parent chain. Now, it is simply named as we name the unbranched. Just count. We have 10. 10, the root word for 10 is deck. Because this is an alkane, how do you know that this is an alkane? Only single bond and it's only hydrocarbons. Hence, what do you have? Deck A. Attach it to A and E. And that's the name of the parent chain. So this is the parent name. We are not done with naming this compound, but this is the parent name. So I'm just trying to show us these things as we go through those rules. Okay? So let's take it out and then continue. Now, the next rule that was mentioned, if multiple longest chains occur, the chain with the most substituent becomes the parent chain. So what does this mean? Consider a situation where you have, or a scenario, where you have C, 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 and then C, C. And then in this case, you have chlorine, and you have, um, let's say, methyl here. And then you have CH3. Okay, let's fill up. CH3, H2, H, H2, and then CH3. Now, let's, let's do our counting. If we are to count straight, this is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So let me use the blue to indicate this. So we have 6. And then use the yellow to indicate another one. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So counting from here, we have another chain. And then it is also 6. So notice this. Count straight 6. Count bent 6. You can actually count from here still 6. We use the red. To indicate that well, it's still the same thing anyways my point is this once you notice that the number of carbon atoms for straight and bent or any other way is the same thing they have multiple longest chains what you use to determine the parent is the one that has more substituents now if we consider the blue which is this straight one the blue which is this straight one let's take away this yellow so that it won't confuse us okay so you notice that it only has one attachment to the continuous chain this is the only attachment here you get so this blue has six carbons with one substituent now let's check for the other one if we decide to draw it this way and then come down bent if we come down bent 
we now have to count this is one two three four five six so six carbon atoms which is still equivalent to this what is going to differentiate them is the number of substituents. now the substituent attached to this yellow is one you can see it attached to here two then you have another thing this is continuous it's going forget about this blue line you can erase that so that it won't confuse us you get so this is continuous going this way which means you have one substituent here another substituent here and then you have another substituent here attached to this continuous yellow part which implies that we have three substituents in this case once you have the same number of carbon atoms and then they have different number of substituents the one that you refer to as your parent chain is the one that has the highest number of carbon atoms with the most substituents this one has six with one this one has six with three substituents hence this becomes the parent chain so when naming you are going to be considering this as your parent chain when you are naming this is important because you'll be allocating locants after you've identified that okay so let's continue to the next room now moving on to the next room uh, as i said the name of the parent chain is as the straight chain when you name the straight chain then note the parent chain can be bent as i mentioned now allocate locants to the parent chain starting from the end closest to a substituent so what does this mean we have identified that this yellow one is the parent chain so let's remove the blue so it won't confuse us just clean that whole line out we know why both of them are six six but then the blue has less substituent that's why it is not the parent chain okay so as i said if you notice i prefer to um segregate or you know my parent chain like i circle it out so that i'll know it's separate from the others and it helps me when i am um, differentiating them from the substituents and all okay so let's get to work now the rule says that we should allocate locants locants are numerical values serial numbers like one two three you are just allocating numbers to each of the carbon in the parent chain not outside the parent chain that's why i said it's important that you um seclude yours with a line or something it makes it easier and clearer so we are going to be allocating numbers so let's allocate those numbers so to each of the carbon but you are going to start from the end closer to a substituent if you come from here you have one two three before you get to the first substituent on from here one two three this is the first substituent so one two three but when you are counting from here you count one two and you have a substituent already which means this side is closer to a substituent than this side hence we are going to be giving the numbers from here so what number this carbon number one this carbon number two this carbon number three this is carbon number four and this is carbon number five okay having said this what else do we need to do so we've allocated the locants uh, as we are asked to do then the next rule now says the substituents are then written as prefixes to the parent chain with its locant separated from it by hyphen okay now before we get to this complicated structure i am just going to um, give you a simple structure and then we'll apply these rules we've learned so far you get then we would, when we are done with the whole rules we'll now get to discuss complicated structures like this now imagine you had something like one two three four five and you have ch3 now ch3 uh let's okay c2 then ch3 okay so okay so if we are to count this h h2 h2 and h3 if we are to count you notice that the longest chain is one two three four five six one two three four nah, nah, this longest chain is, is straight so you have that six this is our parent chain as i said once you have your parent chain it's important you seclude it the parent chain has six carbon so we are going to write that out six carbon the root word for six is hex single bonds alone imply hexane so let's continue now if we're going to allocate locants, as the rule says, we're going to allocate locants from the side closer to a substance. If you come from here, one, two, three, four, before you get to the substance. But if you come from here, one, two, three, before you get to the substance, which means here is closer. So let's allocate the locants number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, and number six. Having said this, let's now get to name. They said that the substituent is going to be named as a prefix. So let's do that. With its locant, this substituent is methyl. As I said, if an alkane occurs as an attachment to a, a chain you have that it is going to be referred to as an alkyl group 
to have that in mind that this particular guy because it has one carbon it is met and then it's occurring as a substituent so methyl so that's that basically so the name of this substituent is methyl however this methyl is located on number three so we need to indicate it so this is three methyl always note between a number and a letter you must indicate or put a hyphen so let's get to that this is going to be three methyl hexane now another thing to note is that between letters there are no um separations there is no comma there is nothing once it is a letter and another letter they are supposed to be together it's supposed to be one word there shouldn't be any space between them so this is going to be referred to as three methyl hexane and that's that basically if i have another structure for instance i have this one two three four and then maybe chlorine is on this end uh, you will notice that I'm going to be allocating my locants from this side because here it's closer to the substituent. So, one, two, three, four. Now, four, the root word for four is boot. Single bonds alone, butane. Now, because this is a substituent, the implication is that I'm going to put it as a prefix. Chlorine, chloro, chlorine, chloro. So, which means we'll have chloro. But where is this chloro located on number two? So, this is going to be two. I won't just leave a space, I'll put a hyphen. I'm not going to put a comma. I'll put a hyphen. Between a number and a letter, what you put is a hyphen. So the name of this compound is going to be 2-chlorobutane. And that's that basically on how to indicate the substituents as prefixes. Okay, moving ahead. The next thing we are going to consider is the, the, the next... Okay, the next we are considering... Okay, okay. Uh, that's, that's in the next slide. Okay, so if the substituents occur multiple times on the parent chain, repeat its locants as many times as its occurrence and add appropriate prefixes such as di, tri, etc. to indicate the number of occurrences. What does this mean? Let's look at this. So let's consider this organic compound. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yes. And there may be chlorine here, chlorine here, and probably another chlorine here. Okay, so if we are to fill hydrogen, CH3, H2, one hydrogen here, H2, H2, and CH3. The longest continuous chain is going to be represented as this one, as we know. Remember, it's important you always have that out. Hydrogen is not a substituent, it's part of the hydrocarbon, so um, you won't consider it as a substituent. It's part of the chain. Okay, now... With that said, the substituents are chlorine, chlorine, chlorine. So you notice that chlorine occurs many times. Before we actually name it, let's give it locants. You allocate locants from the side closer to a substituent. Here is farther from a substituent than here. So we're going to give 1, carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5, carbon 6, and carbon 7. Because here is closer to a substituent. Now, let's get to work. First of all is that because it has 7 carbon atoms, the root word for 7 is hept. It only contains single bonds, so heptane. There's no other major functional group, so we are not going to bother ourselves about that. This is the name. Now, the prefixes are the substituents. And the substituent we have is only chlorine, but this chlorine occurred many times. How many chlorine? One, two, three. Now, to name it is very simple. So because we have a situation where the occurrence is on number three, another occurs on number three. That's why I have three and three. Then another one occurs on number four. So three and three and four then you indicate how many they are trichloro and that is the name of the prefix so let's put this together it is now going to be 3 comma 3 comma 4 how many chlorine trichloroheptane and that's that basically now there shouldn't be any space and then they should be joined together so that's going to be now between numbers you put a comma always have that in mind that between numbers you put a comma or between a number and a letter an alphabet you put a hyphen so that's trichloro and then we put the heptane. Note, there is no space between letters. Okay, so that's that. The name of this compound is T34-trichloroheptane. Okay, having said this, we go to the next rule, which happens to be the final rule for our study. And that rule simply says, if different substituents occurs on the parent chain, arrange them in alphabetical order as prefixes to the parent chain. So you have situations or conditions where multiple um substituents or core take for instance you have this uh one two three four and then you have chlorine here bromine here maybe another chlorine here 
you get or uh, let's add methyl ch3 okay so this is going to be uh h uh h2 and ch3 first of all is the parent chain is the longest chain of carbon atoms and that is this particular guy so having separated them the next thing you do is to allocate locants this is one this is two this is three and this is four now the root word for four carbon atoms is boot but because we have that there are single single bonds the primary suffix will be a there is no major functional group here that's why we will not bother removing the e so moving ahead we'll write them out chloro bromo and methyl are the only substituents we have the rule says arrange them alphabetically so if you know how to read your abcd this becomes easy for you so you notice that in your alphabetical order bromo should come first bromo then we have chloro before you now name methyl so let's name this now if we're going to name we'll start by naming bromo bromo is located on number two so we we'll need to indicate it so two bromo after we are done with naming bromo there's another bromo here so we go to the next one chloro chloro is located on number one the first chloro is on number one the second chloro is on number one still so one one then how many chloro do we have dichloro as you can see because there are two chloros we are going to have chlorine number one chlorine number one so how many are they dichloro i don't with chloro so we go to methyl note you don't use the order you like you have to arrange it alphabetically before you stand in okay so moving ahead we now go to methyl methyl is on number two so that's going to be two methyl and once you are done with two methyl we now get to the parent chain both a now please note this um number this particular word that indicates the number of chlorine does not affect the alphabetical order you are considering the alphabetical order of the substituent so basically this is how to name an organic compound once you consider this, arrange them alphabetically and apply the rest of the rules, and you have your name. I hope this video has been helpful. I remain your favorite country to talk. God. Hi guys, welcome to a few way excellence without stress. And in today's study, we are going to be looking into something very interesting, which is IUPAC nomenclature part two. In this part, we are going to be considering the classes of carbon. We are going to be considering the types of organic structures and how do we convert an IUPAC name to structure. So let's get to it. There are four classes of carbon and these classes are simply dependent on the number of carbon atoms attached to it. That's a simple principle. If it is a primary carbon atom, imagine you have a particular chain, for instance. Let's say you have a particular chain of carbon atoms. One, two, three, four, five. Another carbon here, one here, one here. So I'm going to be numbering them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. A primary carbon atom is simply a carbon atom that is directly attached to only one carbon atom in the chain. And it is usually terminal, meaning that it occurs at the end. So once you hear primary carbon, just know that it is the carbon that the last carbon in the chain. So which means number one is a primary carbon, number five is a primary carbon, number eight is a primary carbon, number six is a primary carbon, number seven is a primary carbon. So have that in mind, that your primary carbons are the ones that occur terminally. Even if I attach another element here, this is not carbon. The last carbon in the chain is what is referred to as primary. And then the second thing about the primary carbon atom is that it is directly attached to only one carbon in the chain. If you now consider the other classes of carbon, your secondary carbon is a carbon atom attached directly to only two carbon atoms in the chain so let's find which carbon atom is directly attached to only two this carbon is attached to one two three this one is attached to one two so this is going to be your secondary carbon so have that in mind that c4 is secondary carbon okay moving ahead you will now notice that your tertiary carbon is the next class of carbon atom and that class of carbon atom is the carbon atom that is directly attached to only three carbon atoms in the chain and you have that the one that would be refer to as our tertiary is c2 so have that in mind c2 is tertiary why is it tertiary because it's attached to three carbon alone in the chain even if you have another element here provided it's not carbon direct attachment it is still tertiary now we move ahead to the next one or probably the final one and that is your quaternary carbon atom 
Your quaternary carbon atom is basically a carbon atom that is directly attached to four carbon atoms in the chain. And with that said, we we'll have that our quaternary carbon atom is C3. So that's that basically. So primary is going to be C1, C6, C7, C8, and C5. You have your secondary is going to be C4. Your tertiary is C2. And your quaternary is C3. Basically that. With that said, let's move ahead. Now, having mentioned this, the next thing we are going to be doing is that we are going to consider the different types of structures. There are about five major types of structures, and I'm just going to be drawing them out. Now, the first structure is what we refer to as your common structure. In your common structure, you just have the carbon atoms and the hydrogen atoms outlined. So if I want to draw butane, common structure of butane, common structure of butane, the common structure is going to be C, 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 C. Now, each carbon atom can bind or get bonded to four different um, or form four different bonds. So just have that in mind that each carbon can form four different bonds. So this is one bond formed, second bond, third bond, and fourth bond. So it's filled. So put this two. This one, two, so remaining two. This one, two, so remaining two. And this is what we refer to as your common structure. The next structure we're going to talk about is your zigzag structure. Your zigzag structure basically involves um, bending of this into a zigzag. So when I have this into a zigzag, it's basically the zigzag structure. So fill in your hydrogen, same thing. Fill in your hydrogen, just that. Fill in your hydrogen, fill in your hydrogen. And that's that basically. This is the zigzag structure. Then we have our staggered structure. Your staggered structure. So the staggered structure is basically where you bring in the hydrogens together. So you have CH3. Instead of writing this one, one, you, this carbon has three hydrogen, you put them together. This carbon has two hydrogen, put them together. This carbon has two, CH2, and then CH3. So this is common, zigzag, this is staggered. Any one of these can actually be given to you, so it's important you know them. So I'll take this all out, and then we go to the next structure. The next structure is what we refer to as the condensed structure. And in the condensed structure, if, for instance, you have a staggered structure represented like this, what you simply do to form the condensed structure is to find common or regular occurring species and put them together. For instance, this is CH2 and this is CH2. So instead of writing it as CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, the condensed structure will now have CH3. Then you write CH2 and then multiply it by 2 and then you have CH3. And that's that basically. So it's important you also know how to expand the condensed structure before you name. So we're going to be looking into how to expand a condensed structure. So imagine I had something like this, CH3. CCH3, and then I had hydrogen, and I had C, uh, bracket CH3, and then I had this, and then I had CH2 into, um, let's say, 4, and then finally I had C, bracket CH3, this CH3 into 3. Okay, so let's get to name this compound, quite simple. The very first thing, not name, expand this thing. First thing you need to note is just start with the carbon. So first, you write your carbon out. Okay, let's, let's create more space so that we will not need to, yes, we need enough space. So as I said, the first thing you're going to do is to write your carbon out. The first carbon you have, you put it out. So this is C. Then every other thing, this is hydrogen surrounding it. So H, H, H. Then you go to the next carbon. Once you have a carbon atom and you notice that something is in front of this carbon, Everything that is in front of this carbon is supposed to be surrounding this carbon. So the first thing we have that is in front of this carbon is CH3. So we surround it first, CH3. Then we have hydrogen. So we have hydrogen. Then we just continue. That's all. We have another carbon here. And this other carbon has two things in front, CH3 into two places. So you have CH3, CH3. Now notice that after this, you do not see another carbon. What you saw directly was CH2. Once you see CH2, CH2 is a part of the main chain. So just outline as many CH2 as is given. If there was a carbon before this particular thing, it would not be like this carbon and then these ones will be surrounding it. But because you don't have a carbon before it and then it is CH2. Once it's CH2, just write out the CH2s like that. So CH2 is basically CH2 into 4. So CH2, 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 and then CH2. And that's that basically for this guy. Once you see a CH2, just spread it out. Do not surround it because it's it's not surrounding basically. Uh, so that's that. So remember I told you, write out a carbon atom, then whatever uh, species is in front of it, surround it, then you continue. 
now we are done with this we now have another carbon atom then this carbon atom is surrounded by ch3 into three places so we start ch3 here ch3 here and then ch3 here so this is the actual structure of this condensed formula i hope this has been helpful then we go into the next form or the next type of structure the next type of structure is what we refer to as the skeletal structure skeletal structure is basically lines so once you consider a skeletal structure you are basically looking at lines what then must you take note about the skeletal structure every terminal and junction indicates a carbon atom that's the first thing so once you see a terminal or a junction it indicates a carbon atom so i'm going to look we're going to outline this so if you have a terminal this is a terminal so carbon is here carbon is a junction carbon is a junction this is another junction carbon is here junction carbon junction carbon junction carbon junction carbon terminal carbon so how many carbon atoms one two three four five six seven eight nine so the name of this compound is none so that's that basically okay so the next point to note about it is that double lines indicate double bond why triple lines indicate triple bond so once you have a double line indicated here it indicates that this is going to be an alkene if you have uh, a triple bond, this is now double bond and uh, a triple bond. So there's going to be an enine. So if we're going to name this compound, basically we are going to come from the side. Well, we'll talk about this basically as we go further in our study of naming. But what I want us to understand is basically how to outline this structure. So once you're considering this structure, if you have a terminal, each terminal indicates a carbon atom. Double bonds or two lines indicate double bonds. Why three lines indicate triple bonds? And that is that basically about our different types of organic structure. The next part of this study is now how do we convert an IUPAC name to a structure? So I'm going to give us an example. And then with this example, we are going to be naming or following the principles. So to be able to understand this, we are going to try to convert this particular compound into its structure. So the name of the compound we are considering is 2-dibromo-3-chloro-4-propyl-dodec-4-6-dienoic acid. Okay, it's already looking too long, but yes, we are going to use this. And once you're able to convert this, there is no problem. You can convert every single organic compound name to a structure. The first thing you need to do is to outline the number of carbon atoms in the root word of the parent name. So, doing a little revision for us again, this whole part before the parent chain is the prefix. We don't have an infix here, so we have that this is the root word. So the root word dodec indicates 12 carbon atoms. So have that in mind, dodec indicates 12. And then we have that this particular part is the primary suffix. Primary suffix, and then finally we have our secondary suffix. Okay, so moving ahead, let's get to work. So the prefix, as I said, is this particular part. And having that as our prefix, we are going to have um, start the, the first rule says that we should not consider the prefix, but outline the number of carbon atoms in the root words of the parent name. So the root word of the parent name is, is dodec, which means 12. So we're going to put out 12 carbon atoms. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Just to confirm. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, now that we're done with that, we go to the next rule. Allocate locants to the outlined carbon atoms. Locants are simply serial numbers. So we're going to give numbers. So this is 1, this is 2, this is 3, this is 4, this is 5, this is 6, this is 7, this is 8, this is 9, this is 10, this is 11, and this is 12. The next thing we're going to do is to attach the major functional groups to the carbon of the corresponding locant. So what does this mean? You are going to be looking at your secondary suffix for that. Your secondary suffix is what indicates the major functional group. And in this case, we have oic acid, which means that the functional group for oic acid is going to be carboxylic. Now, once you notice that there is no number before the major functional group or before the secondary suffix, it means that that particular functional group is located on number one. So have that in mind. It's located on number one. So carboxylic group is COOH. So that's why we are putting it on number one for the oic acid. Moving ahead. The very next thing we are going to do is that we are going to attach multiple bonds, if present, to the carbon of corresponding locants and a consecutively higher carbon. So the implication is that we are going to check, do we have multiple bonds? If we look at our structure, we do have. So that's 4, 6, di, in, oic. So in is found on number 4 and number 6. Now, but when you are putting it, you are putting it between this number 4 and a consecutively higher locant. So that's 4 and 5. 
then for six it's going to be between six and seven so that's that basically so two ins means that you know it basically and that's that basically so we go to the next rule what is the next rule saying the next rule is saying attach other substituents to the corresponding locants and then finally you fill the remaining spaces with hydrogen bearing in mind that carbon can only form four bonds so the only other things that are remaining here are this part so let's start filling them two two dibromo so which means bromo the first bromo is on number two second bromo is on number two then we have three chloro which means chlorine is on number three then we have four propyl propyl is c3h7 so that's uh four on number four so propyl c3h7 prop three and uh, basically that is that then we now fill with hydrogen remember carbon can contain only four bonds so this carbon has one two three four so it's filled this one has one two three four so it's filled this one has one two three so it remains one so put hydrogen this one has one two three four filled this one has one two three so remaining one hydrogen this one has one two three remaining one hydrogen this one has one two three remaining one hydrogen this one has one two so hydrogen here two hydrogen one hydrogen so this is one two remaining two to make it four this one two remaining two bonds to make it four this one two remaining two bonds to make it four this is one remaining three so three hydrogen atoms with this i presume you have understood how to convert an iupac organic name to a structure thank you very much Hi guys, welcome to A Few Way Excellence Without Stress and we are going to be looking into IUPAC Nomenclature 3. Here we are going to be naming unsaturated hydrocarbons. So let's get into it. The rules for naming unsaturated hydrocarbons include, first off, identify the parent chain. Now, the parent chain is the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms which must contain as many multiple bonds as possible and major functional groups. So let's look at this particular compound I'm about to outline. So with this compound, we'll start applying our principle. So if you have a particular compound, let's say you have C, 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 C. Uh, okay. And then you have a double bond here, a double bond here. And then you have C, 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 C. So notice this. The longest continuous chain is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But then, according to our rule, once you notice a multiple bond, you would have that the parent chain is the chain that contains as many multiple bonds as possible. If you had counted nine, you would only have one double bond. If you count like this, you would only have one double bond, which means to accommodate the most number of double bonds, we have to take this as our parent chain. So that's that basically in identifying the parent chain once you notice a double bond. If you have a double bond, the parent chain must contain as many multiple bonds as possible and that is what happened here. That's why we did not choose the longest chain in this case. This is just one bond though, not double. Uh, let me just correct that. This is just a single bond. So as I said, in this structure or whenever you are dealing with an alkene or alkyne, once you notice a particular chain that has the most number of double bonds, that one becomes your parent chain, irrespective of the length of the chain. Note that the one with the longest chain that has the most number of double bonds or triple bonds will become your parent chain. Okay, moving ahead. You will now notice that the second thing to do is that we should allocate locants starting from the end closest to the multiple bond if there are no other functional groups of higher priority. So it's important you know that there is priority, basically, or order of priority. And we'll discuss that in the next study. But just note that once you're not seeing any other functional group, your alkanol, your alkanol, you can see those guys. All you simply do is to start allocating locant from the end closest to the multiple bond. So notice this end is one, two before we get to a double bond. But this one is on the first one. So which means you're going to start counting from here. So this is going to be one, two, three, four, five. Okay, moving on to the next one. The next rule now says, um, uh, if the position of the multiple bond does not affect its locant, then the locants allocate locants from the side closest to the other substituent. Imagine you had um, chlorine close to this side. Now, if we are to check or apply the, let's look at this rule, this, the second rule. The second rule says we should allocate locants starting from the end closest to the double bond if there are no other functional groups of higher priority. And if you check this particular molecule, you will notice that this molecule does not have any other functional group of higher priority. Let's look at that. Look at this. 
so you notice that the only other functional group is chlorine and halides have lower priority to alkenes we'll see that in the next study now having said this how are we going to allocate locants if i decide to start from here this is one two three four i've got into the multiple bond this is one two three four i've got into the multiple bond so whether i count from here or from here the position of the multiple bond will not affect the numbering in this scenario i cannot just choose anywhere since the multiple bond is not affected i will now consider another factor what is the other factor i'm considering the substituent so i will now have to count from the side closest to the substituent since either of this side counting will not affect double bond but remember i said before you check for substituent it's important that you consider your double bond or your triple bond as the case may be so since we have that this is closer to a substituent we are counting from here this is going to be one two three four five six seven eight okay so moving ahead we go to the very next point and the very next point is yeah let's go down so when they mean the parent chain the root word is attached to the primary suffix which indicates its own saturation in for double bond and ein for triple bond okay so um we have two compounds there so let's let's have their parent names i'm going to have to change one of them so that we can be able let's change this to ein okay so if we are naming the parent chain the parent chain for this particular guy so this is a this is b so the parent's name for a parent's name for a is going to be let's count this is one two three four five so this is five five indicates pent so the root word is pent now the primary suffix which indicates unsaturation indicates that there's a double bond between one and two so you are taking the lower locant and between three and four so this is going to be pent one comma three how many ins we have two double bonds so that's going to be die in because there is no other functional group we're just going to end it with e so that's that this case so this is pent one two pent so this is pent one three die in so we can check that out in our rule as we said that once you are dealing with this when naming the parent chain the root word is attached to the primary suffix which indicates its own saturation in for double bond and ein for triple bond now the lesser locant of the two carbon atoms bearing the multiple bond is written after the root word before the primary suffix to indicate the position of the multiple bond what well, that's what we basically did here so between one and two you take the lower number this is between three and four you take the lower number that's why we have pent one three die in then for this particular guy here this parent's name is eight so root word is oct and then we have that it is found between four and five triple bond is ein. so this is oct between four and five take the lesser locant this is oct four ein. there is no other functional group here so we're just going to put our a and that's the name of the parent name remember we have not named this compound this is just the parent name for this particular guy then we go to the next one the final rule says other substituents are written as prefixes to the parent name just as the case of alkane so we have that the substituent here is one two three four five and that's pent when a pentane group is occurring as a substituent is referred to as pentyl so this pentyl is located on number two so the name of this compound is going to be two pentyl then we have pent one comma three diene while on this other hand this is the substituent which is number two a chlorine we could decide to put one more chlorine so make it more fun so this is going to be two comma three how many chlorine dichloro dichloro and then we now attach our parent chain oct four ion so notice what i mentioned in these cases between a number and a letter there is a hyphen and between two numbers you have a comma take note of that this was also discussed in our arcane video so please make sure you watch these videos sequentially i hope with this you have been able to know how to name your unsaturated compounds thank you very much <music>
imagine for instance you have a situation where if you look at this compound let's consider this compound if you consider this structure you will notice that i have a carboxylic group which indicates my alkanoic acid and i have a hydroxyl group which indicates my alkanol let me just add one more your chlorine or something like that and probably put a double bond here so if we are to consider the functional groups we have here are carboxylic hydroxyl chlorine is not a major functional group, but yeah the halide and then we have the double bond which is for alkenes which of these ones has the highest priority that is the first thing we are going to check because the one with the highest priority is the one that is going to serve as your secondary suffix so in the order of priority carboxylic group or carboxylic acid is the highest then you talk about your acid anhydrides your esters which are your alkanoates your acid halides your acid halides are basically your alkanoyl group or acyl groups your acid amides basically your amides your amides are made up of your carbonyl and your amine group you have your nitrile your aldehyde comes then before ketones then alcohol so i'm just giving you this order that the highest amongst all of them is the carboxylic group uh, look at this order and have this order in your head with that said this is what is going to help us out in putting down the name of this particular compound so let's get to the different rules for naming the first rule is to identify the parent chain the parent chain is the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms which must possess the functional group of highest priority and as many functional groups and multiple bonds as possible so if we have this structure um, i'm going to modify it a little bit i need to modify it so that we can be able to understand this rule okay so modifying the structure a little bit so you find out that it is not just the longest chain but it's the longest chain that has the functional group of highest priority and as i saw as we saw in the list carboxylic group is the highest functional group so which means this parent chain must have this carboxylic group so we'll start from there so starting from this end drawing our carboxylic group it must also contain as many functional groups as possible so if you count one two three four five six seven eight this is longer but then it would miss out the double bond here so which means that we are not going to follow this part so we're going to take the longest chain that will have the most number of functional group and substituent and that is the straight chain even though it's not the longest provided it has the most number of functional group multiple bonds substituent it is referred to as the parent chain so we have that so we go to the next one so going to the next rule the next rule now says to name the parent chain the root word indicating the number of carbon atoms in the chain is attached to the primary suffix which indicates the saturation or unsaturation then the functional group of highest priority is then attached as a secondary suffix what does this mean first of all before we do that we're going to allocate our locants we're going to start allocating from the functional group of highest priority so that's here so one two three four five six seven so now that we have this the root word for seven is hept we are going to have hept and then we now attach our next thing is the primary suffix primary suffix indicates saturation and unsaturation if it is double bond the primary suffix is in if it is single bond is in if it is triple bond is in so what do we have here double bond and it is between five and six so we need to indicate the locant always indicate the locant or positions of everything that is found in the chain so this is between five and six we take this one so that's going to be helped five in now we're not going to end it with e because there's another functional group of higher priority and that functional group of highest priority is carboxylic which is indicated as oic so this is going to be helped five in oic acid so with this said um that is that basically about naming the parent chain now if you had a different scenario let's say you had this this is one two three uh yes let's say you had this so you will notice that in this particular chain now the parent name is going to be this three and then the root word is going to be prop haven't gotten the root word because we have only single bonds it's going to be propane but we're not going to put it because we have a functional group oh which is for alkanol now alkanols when you're writing them as um, secondary suffixes would be represented as all however you need to show us where this all is this all is on number two so this is going to be propan to all so that's that basically so coming back to this we have that this is hept 5 enoic acid so what then do we do with the other parts the other substituents and lower priority functional groups 
are then named just as in our king. The last thing we're going to do is to indicate the substituents and then you have your lower functional groups. Because they do not occur as your secondary suffix, you're going to have to write them as a prefix. OH is represented as hydroxy when written as a prefix. But if you're writing it here, if it is the highest priority, then it's going to be all. But then because it is not the highest priority, we are going to treat it as a prefix and it's hydroxyl. This is 1, 2, 3, which is propyl. So we have hydroxyl and we have propyl. Remember to arrange them in an alphabetical order. Yeah, it's already in alphabetical order. So which means our final answer is going to be that the name of these functional groups. So we are going to have to include the straight chain because this one has a triple bond. So with that said, it's going to be like this. Haven't gotten this. The next thing to consider is what is the functional group of highest priority here? This is a carbonyl group and it's non terminal. And once you have a non terminal carbonyl group, you are talking about your alkanones, alkanones or ketones. So, which means in this case, the functional group of highest priority here is your ketone. Having said that, let's get to work. So, if we are going to name this compound, applying the rules, we've identified the parent's name, then we allocate locants. One, two, three, four, five. We are starting from this side because this is the side closest to the functional group of highest priority. This is a functional group, but we can't start from here. Why? Because ketones has a higher priority over alkynes. So with that said, we have one, two, three, four, five. And uh, so if we are looking at the root word for this compound, five indicates pent. So this is going to be pent. Then we have our primary suffix, which indicates unsaturation. Triple bond is ion. Where is this ion found between 4 and 5? So this is spent 4 ion. Now, because there is another functional group of higher priority, we are not just going to end it with E. We are going to end it with the name of this secondary suffix or this functional group as a secondary suffix. And once you have carbonyl group non-terminal occurring in a particular compound, it indicates alkanones. And alkanones are represented by the functional group O, N, E. So that's going to be pent 4 ion. O N E. So that's that for the parent's name. So this is the parent's name. Then we now attach our prefix. Our prefix is one, two, three, four, which is butyl. And then another one is chloro. So if we are to arrange them alphabetically, butyl will definitely come before chloro. So naming this compound, the name of the compound will now be butyl is found on number three. So this will be three butyl. Then the chloro is also found on number three. So three chloro. Uh, with that said, there is no other substituent. We now put the parent's name. Pent for I known. So that's that basically about naming non-hydrocarbons. Hope you've been able to learn something in this class. Thank you very much. <laughs>
together with cycloalkanes are classified under your aliphatic hydrocarbons. The aromatics are the ones that possess the benzene ring. So have that in mind. Aliphatics include your alkanes, alkene, alkynes, including your cyclo um, alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. However, in the case of your aromatics, you have your benzene ring or benzene related structures. Now, with that said, hydrocarbons could broadly be referred to as either saturated or unsaturated. When you say a hydrocarbon is saturated, the implication is that it is completely filled. Saturation means completely filled. And because of that, you would have that only single bonds will be possessed between the carbon atoms. So take note of that. Now, when you have a saturated hydrocarbon, it means that every carbon atom in that chain possesses only single bonds. But when you say it is unsaturated, the implication is that you either have a double bond or a triple bond. Hence, addition reaction will be characteristic to compounds that have double bond or triple bond. Such compounds or hydrocarbons are in the homologous series alkenes and alkynes. So let's get to discuss this homologous series. Alkenes are saturated hydrocarbons containing only carbon carbon single bonds. So the only thing that I found in alkenes is that they are hydrocarbons number one and because they are hydrocarbons are saturated, the implication is that they only possess single bonds between carbon atoms and hydrogen too. They are represented by the general molecular formula CnH2n plus 2, where n is an integer or whole number. Alkanes are also called paraffins. Examples will be seen below. But before we get to that, let's briefly talk about what they are trying to imply in this description. So you have that the general formula for alkanes is CnH2n plus 2. Which means, if I'm looking for an alkene that has 12 carbon atoms, I simply have carbon equals 12, so n is equals 12, so this will be C12, H2 times 12 plus 2. And then the chemical molecular formula for an alkene that has 12 carbon atoms will be C12, H20, 24 plus 2, which is going to be 26. So you have that basically. And that's why we have those general molecular formulas. Moving ahead, we'll consider some examples um, of the alkenes. Uh, so looking at them, the first four members include your methane. So methane contains just one carbon atom. Uh, the next member includes your ethane, which contains two carbon atoms. You have your propane, which contains three. And then you have your butane, which contains four. So if we are to write those things or write their chemical formulas based on what we know, you will find out that it is going to be represented as, so for methane, you have that C is equals 1. So it's going to be C1 H2 times 1 plus 2. So that's going to be C. 2 times 1 is 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. So CH4 is methane. If you are going to write for ethane, N is going to be equals to. So that's going to be C2 H2 times 2 plus 2. And that's going to be C2 H4 plus 2, which is going to be C2 H6. Then for your propane, so this is uh, methane. This is ethane. Then if we are going to consider propane, let's take this out quickly. Uh, okay, So if we take this out so we can be able to uh, write the others. Okay, so you have that um, considering your propane, N is equals 3, 3 carbon atoms. Prop is the root word for 3. And that is going to be expressed as C3 h2 times 3 plus 2 and that's going to be c3 2 times 3 is 6 6 plus 2 is 8 then for butane it is going to be given as n equals 4 so c4 h2 times 4 plus 2 hence it's going to be c4 h10 so these are the chemical formulas for methane ethane propane and butane going back to our study so with that said um you would notice some things about this particular alkane that the members of alkane uh, actually differ from each other consecutive members differ from each other in the group by a molecular formula of ch2 so to buttress the point i just made we are going to be considering two consecutive members as we said consecutive members of a homologous series differ from each other by the molecular formula of ch2 now if we have 
one, which is methane, the consecutive member of methane, or immediately after methane, you have ethane, which is C2H6. Looking for their difference would mean C2H6 minus CH4. Doing this, H6 minus H4 is H2, and C2 minus C is going to be C. Hence, you have that. Once you are looking at the difference between consecutive members, the molecular formula is going to be CH2. Now, this doesn't only apply here. As many other homologous series as possible, once you are looking at the difference between consecutive members, it is always going to be CH2. And if you don't consider the molecular formula, the molar mass is going to be 14. So just have that in mind um, for these organic compounds. Okay, moving ahead. Um, so, having said that, let's consider the next homologous series, which is alkenes. Alkenes, otherwise called olefins, are unsaturated hydrocarbons. The implication is that they either have double bonds or triple bonds, but in the case of alkenes, they have double bonds. The general molecular formula for an alkene is given as CnH2n. So, the implication is that I can use this general molecular formula to determine the members of this homologous series quite easily. Take, for instance, I tell you, what is the molecular formula of an alkene that has four carbon atoms? That's simply going to be CnH2n being the general molecular formula for alkene. If I'm looking for an alkene with four carbon atoms, it's going to be C4H2 times 4. Hence, the chemical formula for butene would now be C4H8. Even if I want to look for the molecular formula of an alkene with 30 carbon atoms, so it's going to be C30H2 times 30, and that is going to be C30H60, and that's that basically. So once you are considering alkenes, the general molecular formula for alkenes is CnH2. Moving back to our study, the functional group of alkenes is simply their double bond. So when you consider an alkene, what is used to identify an alkene is simply the fact that it has double bond between its carbon atoms. So that's that basically. It's a hydrocarbon with a double bond. Alkynes, on the other hand, are unsaturated hydrocarbons containing at least one triple bond between the carbon atoms in the molecule. This is given by the general molecular formula CnH2n minus 2. So the implication is if we are to look for the formula of an alkene, an alkyne, because the general formula is CnH2n minus 2, if I am looking for an alkyne, this for alkynes, if I'm looking for an alkyne with 14 carbon atoms, this should be tetra decaine. So if I'm looking for an alkyne with 14 carbon atoms, is going to be given as C14 H2 times 14 minus 2. And that's going to be C14 H2 times 14 is 28. 28 minus 2 is 26. And that's that basically. So this is tetra decaine, basically. So that's that basically about your alkynes general molecular formula. Remember, I mentioned earlier that the functional group of alkynes is the fact that they have triple bonds, at least one triple bond between carbon atoms. So if we have to consider this, this is the list of the first four members of your alkynes. The first four, this is a typo. So the first four members of your alkynes, you have that the first member is ethyne, propyne, butyne, and pentyne. Uh, comparison between alkane, alkenes, and alkynes. First of all, is we look at the properties, the general molecular formula for alkane is CnH2n plus 2. Alkane is CnH2n. And then alkyne is CnH2n minus 2. The nature is that alkenes are saturated because they only possess single bonds, hence they are filled. Um, alkenes are unsaturated and alkynes are unsaturated. Then the reactions that are characteristic to alkenes are substitution reaction, while in the case of your alkenes, it is addition and polymerization. Now, the only alkyne that can undergo polymerization is ethyne. And then secondly, you will have that terminal alkynes can also undergo substitution reaction. When you say terminal, it means that the triple bond is on the last or a terminal carbon atom. So let's talk about the removal and addition of hydrogen. When two atoms of hydrogen are removed from an alkene, alkene it forms an alkene. And consequently, two are removed from an alkene to form an alkyne. 
So you notice that the relationship between the two of them is like alkane differs from alkene corresponding alkene by two, while alkyne, alkene differs from corresponding alkyne by two, which means that alkane will differ from corresponding alkyne by four. As you can see, C2H6 for two carbon, C2H4 for two carbon in alkene, and then C2H2 for alkyne. So if you look at that, you will notice that the differences is by two for the consecutive that's alkane by two to alkene, alkene by two to alkyne, and basically that. So we go into your cyclic hydrocarbons. Now, this has the end carbon atoms of an acyclic carbon chain joined together by a single covalent bond to form a ring or a loop. So if you are to consider your cyclic hydrocarbons, you will notice that instead of having your open chains like this, you will find out that these chains would actually be linked to each other to form a cycle or loop. Basically, that's the major emphasis in your cyclic hydrocarbons. So let's consider um, uh, examples. So if you look at this particular structure, this is cyclopentane. Notice that everything around it, all the carbon atoms, there's no free-ended carbon atom. All the carbon atoms are joined together in a loop by single bonds. It could also be double bonds, as many bonds as possible. Now, aromatic hydrocarbons. These are cyclic compounds which contain one or more benzene rings. So have that once you are referring to an aromatic hydrocarbon, the emphasis in aromatic is benzene ring and as we know the benzene ring um, structure let's see that in the next page is represented by this so you notice that the the benzene ring usually was represented by this where you have six carbon atoms and three um, double bonds but then this double bond is constantly moving hence to properly represent this instead of putting two different structures we have a hybrid structure where we have the circle in the center indicating the constant movement. So have that in mind, that when you are considering your, your aromatic compounds, the benzene ring is an emphasis. It is what basically determines your aromatic hydrocarbons. Examples of these aromatic hydrocarbons include phenol, which is your hydroxyl group substituted to your benzene ring, your toluene, which is the methyl group attached to the benzene ring, and your xylene, which is your two methyl groups attached to um, your benzene ring. Benzene was discovered in 1825, but its structure was obscured until 1865. This was actually postulated or proposed by August Keku. He showed that the structure of benzene is a resonance hybrid conical form, which are both of equal energy content. So as I said, there are two structures to represent a benzene ring, but then they combined together to form a hybrid structure, which is the one where you have six sides and then a central ring. We now go into haloalkanes. They are chemical compounds formed when one or more of the hydrogen in an alkane have been replaced by halogen atoms, such as bromine, chlorine, fluorine, and the rest of them. The general chemical formula for your haloalkanes are CnH2n plus 1x, where x represents a halogen atom. The examples of these haloalkanes include your bromoethane, your chloropropane, your iodobutane, your fluoromethane, and the rest of them. What are the terms associated with hydrocarbons? The first term we are going to consider is the homologous series. Now, the homologous series basically is described as a series of organic compounds or family of organic compounds which have the same functional group ascending in steps by CH2 or a molecular mass of 14. The implication is that when you have consecutive members and they are in the same homologous series, the difference between them would always be CH2 as we have discussed initially. If you don't want to consider the molecular formula of CH2, you consider the molecular mass of 14. So but the emphasis in the homologous series is that they must have the same functional group. And what does this mean? If for instance you consider this particular compound, I'm going to write four compounds. Uh, you have CH3, CH2OH. You have CH3, COOH. You have CH3OH. And then you have C2, uh, C3H7OH. So notice A, B, and C, and D. 
OH is the functional group here. OH is the functional group here. OH is the functional group here. But here you have COOH, which means the one that is not part of this family is this guy. Why? Because you will notice that it does not have the same functional group as represented. So just take note of that. That once a particular compound does not have the same functional group as the others, the implication is that it is not in the same homologous series. But once you notice similar functional groups, automatically they are in the same homologous series. Okay, moving ahead. Um, uh, we now go ahead to talk about uh, the characteristics of this particular homologous series. Now, the first characteristic is that they are represented by the same general molecular formula. So, for instance, now, every alkene or every member of an alkene has the formula CNH2N. Every member in an alkene has the general molecular formula CNH2N plus 2. If you are dealing with an alcohol, it has general molecular formula CNH2N plus 1 OH. That is for your monohybrid alcohols. The second one is that each member of a series, consecutive members, that is the term supposedly uh, is correct to be used there. It should be consecutive members of the series differ from each other by CH2. I've mentioned that before. So imagine I have, let's say I have methanol. Methanol has the chemical, general chemical formula for alkanols is CN. H2N plus 1OH, but this is for your monohydrate, um, monohydric um, alkanols. So with this said, the implication is that um, if it's one carbon atom, it's going to be CH2 times 1, that's CH3OH. This is methanol. Consecutive to methanol, that's 1, 2, is ethanol, so C2H5OH. If we are to do the difference between these members, it's going to be C2H5OH minus CH3OH. If we do this, this is 0, this is going to be H2, and this is going to be C. So notice that 0 is like nothing. So this is going to be CH2. So notice that no matter the compound, no matter the homologous series, once you check the difference between consecutive members, it is always going to give you CH2. If it doesn't give you CH2, you can also check the um, molecular mass. The molecular mass difference is also going to be 14. So you can check it. The total molecular mass of this compound is 12 times 2, 24 plus 5, that's 29 plus 1, 30, 30 plus 16 is 46. In this case, you have 12 plus 4, and that is um, 12 plus 4 is going to give you 20. Uh, sorry. 12 plus 4 is going to give you 16, 16 plus 16 is 32. So when you divide, or differences that look for the difference this is going to be four and this is going to be one so anytime you are dealing with compounds or consecutive members in the same homologous series they differ from each other by the molecular formula of CH2 or the molecular mass of 14 moving ahead the members show regular gradations of physical properties yes their physical properties are similar they also express similar chemical properties that's why your alkenes are characterized by substitution, your alkenes are characterized by addition, reaction, and polymerization, your alkynes also are characterized by your addition, reaction. Remember I mentioned earlier on that the only alkyne or the only class of alkynes that undergo polymerization are your terminal alkynes. That is, your alkynes that have a triple bond at the terminal. The second term we need to talk about is functional group. Mm -hmm. Functional group is an atom or radical. They could also comprise of bonds that determine the chemical properties of a homologous series. So if you notice something here, when we were talking about alkanols, what we mentioned as the constant in alkanols is OH. You can have as many carbon atoms as possible, but once you have the hydroxyl group, you are talking about an alkanol. So the functional group is that thing that once you see, it characterizes a homologous series. Like in the carboxylic or alkanoid group, you have a carboxylic group. For your alkenes, they are hydrocarbons with only single bonds. Alkenes, double bonds, alkynes, triple bonds. So these things that characterizes um, a particular homologous series are referred to as the functional group. So what is cracking and what is reformation of gasoline? Cracking is the breaking down of large molecules in fuel oil into smaller molecules of greater volatility. This process involves splitting heavy molecules into smaller molecules in the presence of high temperature and pressure. Cracking could either be catalytic or thermal. If the breaking down of the large molecules of hydrocarbon is done in the presence of heat, 
and pressure only. It is termed thermal cracking. But if it is in the presence of catalyst, such as your silica, alumina, at a temperature of 450 to 550 degrees Celsius, at ordinary pressure to produce high octane petrol, it is termed catalytic cracking. So just note that cracking is simply breaking. When you crack, you are breaking it from larger molecules to smaller molecules. The major emphasis in cracking is that cracking increases the quantity of your petrol. The petrol is used in high amounts and during fractional distillation of crude oil, only 20% of the whole distillate is petrol. However, petrol is one of the most used petroleum distillates that exists. So, to increase the amount of petrol, instead of depending only on the distillate, we now crack larger molecules to produce more petrol. So, cracking increases the quantity of petrol. Now, on the other hand, reforming increases or improves the quality. It basically involves the alteration of the molecular structure of a hydrocarbon. So when you alter the structure of a hydrocarbon such that it becomes more better. For instance, when you consider your petrol, uh, more branched petrol have higher quality than straight chain petrol. So the implication is that the more branched your or bent your petrol molecule or the constant uh, molecules of your petrol are, the higher its quality. So what reforming does is that it helps to improve those qualities by branching the straight chain molecules such that they become more branched, basically. So this is the conversion of straight chain hydrocarbons to branching hydrocarbons um, in your C6 to C10 range to improve the octane rating of your motor fuel. So your motor fuel, as I have been mentioning, is your gasoline or your petrol. Now, with this said, if we are considering octane rating, Octane rating is simply the measure of the performance of the fuel in a fuel engine. Yes, it's more like measuring quality. You get. So I've mentioned this before, that when you're talking about the quality of petrol, the quality of petrol is depending on how branched that petrol is. However, to improve that quality, we use reforming. When we are now measuring the quality of petrol, what is used as a measuring factor is the octane rating. So when you're measuring the performance, you're looking at the octane rating. Now, the octane rating of petrol is raised by the presence of branching hydrocarbons known as the 224 trimethyl pentane, also called the ISO octane. To understand the principle of octane number, I would prefer you see octane number as a ratio of ISO octane to n heptane. So if you're considering a ratio of isooctane, 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 which we know is um, two two four trimethyl pentane. The ratio of isooctane to your n heptane. Your n heptane is simply straight chain heptane. As we've mentioned before. The that's C seven H sixteen. As we've mentioned before, the the straight the more straight when you have more straight molecules in your petrol, it means that the petrol is bad. If you have more branched, it means that the quality of the petrol is good. So the ratio of this branched to straight chain is what gives us the octane number. So if I tell you that the octane number is 70 is to 30 or the ratio of iso octane is 70 is to 30 it simply means that the octane number is 70 percent that's that if i tell you that the ratio is if i have that n heptane proportion is 45 what is the octane number once you find the number of octane here that's the octane number so 45 what are we going to do 100 minus 45 because the highest octane rating is 100 five, five, five. this is going to give us 55 so which means that the octane number is going to be 55. So once you are looking at the number of octane with respect to n heptane, that is what gives the octane number. And as I said, the higher the octane number, the indication is that there are more branched molecules or more branched substances than straight chain. That's what this particular octane number or octane rating indicates. Now, moving ahead, as I said, it ranges from 0 to 100. And if a petrol contains 100% of n heptane, if it has 100% of n heptane, the implication is that the octane number will be equals zero. But if it has 100% of isooctane, 
it means that the octane number would be equals 100 so just have that in mind that total n heptane means zero octane number but when you have a hundred percent of isooctane it means hundred percent octane number however also understand this ratio if you have 70 of octane number your n heptane rating will be 30 so just have that in mind that this proportion is what describes the octane number and as i said the higher your amount of isooctane the higher the quality of petrol so let's get to discuss this so what is knocking this is the tapping sound in the cylinder of an ignition engine as a result of abnormal combustion in the engine which makes the engine to lose power so this could be prevented by addition of branched chain alkanes that is your iso octane or lead tetra -ethyl. so have that in mind that if you want to prevent knocking just introduce your tetra -ethyl lead or improve the quality of your petrol that is by increasing the branching and as i said increasing branching is basically referred to as reform now let's get into the different reactions involving hydrocarbons the first reaction we're going to consider is substitution reaction this reaction is the most common reaction alkanes undergo it involves direct replacement of hydrogen in the alkane molecule by another atom or group of atoms an example is in methane with sunlight acting as a catalyst so if you noticed here we have four hydrogen atoms. when one of the chlorine attacks it replaces one of the hydrogens and you have C3Cl. Then the hydrogen that are left to combine with the remaining chlorine and then you have HCl. Same thing applies until all the hydrogen atoms are basically replaced. So that's that. Substitution is basically replacement. So when you think substitution, think replacement. The next reaction that occurs in hydrocarbons is your combustion. Uh, before we continue, note, substitution reaction is characteristic to your alkanes. Another group of hydrocarbons that undergo substitution reaction are your terminal alkynes. Not all the alkynes, but terminal alkynes. When I say terminal alkynes, they are alkynes that um, basically have the triple bond occurring at the terminal end. So, for instance, if you look at ethyne, for instance, so you will notice that ethyne has the triple bond on the terminal carbons hence is a terminal hydrocarbon or a terminal alkyne so take note of that the terminal alkynes terminal alkynes and alkanes undergo substitution reaction so that's that basic as we mentioned your complex sugar basically includes starch cellulose and your glycogen so with that said we go to combustion combustion is basically a reaction of a hydrocarbon with oxygen so anytime a hydrocarbon is burning in excess oxygen usually there are only two products given the first product is carbon four oxide and the next product is water it can be represented by the general equation cxhy plus x plus y over 4o2 reacting to give xco2 plus y over 2 co2 as well over to page two let's let's consider what this looks like now if you consider a particular reaction we said once it's combusting and it's complete combustion it's going to be cx hy plus bracket x plus y over four o2 reacting to give x co2 plus y over two h2 so let's consider this. In this particular reaction, now imagine it was 18 C2H4. If this is going to be reacting with oxygen, X is going to be 2 and Y is equals 4. So X is 2, Y is 4. So let's fill it in. So this is going to be uh, 2 plus 4 over 4 O2 reacting to give 2 CO2 plus 4 over 2 H2O. So with that said, you'll find out that our balanced equation will now be C2H4 plus, this is going to be 2 plus, 4 over 4 is 1, so 2 plus 1, O2, reacting to give 2 CO2 plus 4 over 2 is 2 H2O, and then the final reaction is going to be C2H4 plus, 2 plus 1 is 3, O2, reacting to give 2 CO2 
plus 2 equals 2. And this reaction is balanced because if you check it, the carbon atoms here are 2, the carbon atoms here are 2. Hydrogen is 4 here, hydrogen is 2 times 2, which is 4. Oxygen here is 6, oxygen here is 4 plus 2, which is also 6. So that is the general equation for balancing any combustion reaction of a hydrocarbon. Okay, now with that said, we move on to the next property. And the next property is your addition reaction. Addition reaction is characteristic to unsaturated hydrocarbons. So take note of that. Alkenes cannot undergo addition because they are not um, unsaturated. Alkenes are saturated. This type of reaction is a reaction in which there is direct addition of an attacking atom or radical across the double or triple bonds of unsaturated compounds to yield a saturated product or at least one with higher degree of saturation. So the implication is that when addition is occurring, you are increasing the saturation or combating it to a saturated compound. So, take for instance, if we consider hydrogenation of ethene, let's consider that reaction. If you consider hydrogenation of ethene, uh, let's say you have C2H4. I prefer to, let, let's outline the bonds. So you have this. So during addition reaction, Basically, instead of writing as H2, I'm going to write as HH. One of these hydrogen atoms will attack one side of the bond, while the other one will attack the other side of the bond. And why they're attacking it is simply to break it. Once they break it, you have that this bond, instead of existing between carbon and hydrogen, will now be shared between carbon and this attacking hydrogen, while the same thing happens here. And when that happens, you notice that it is converted from an unsaturated compound to a saturated compound. So just have that in mind that in addition reaction, you are either converting to a saturated compound or increasing its level of saturation. With that said, we go to the next point. So these are the other reactions that you could consider. Uh, other reactions could include addition of your, your hetero atomic molecules, basically. So polymerization. Polymerization is the process of linking together many units of simple molecules called monomers of the same substance to form more complex molecules known as polymers. In the case of polymerization, it's important to take note of the fact that um, it occurs in alkenes. And not every alkyne can undergo polymerization. The only polymerization that is occurring in alkyne is the polymerization of ethyne to form benzene. So take note, alkenes have the ability to undergo polymerization, but in alkynes, the only alkyne that undergoes polymerization is your ethyne. And when ethyne is polymerized, it forms benzene. Ethene polymerizes to form polyethene, propene polymerizes to form polypropene, and the rest of them. So, having said this, we go to isomerism. Iso means same, and mer means part. So isomers are different compounds having the same molecular formula. The existence of these compounds called isomers with the same molecular formula but different physical or chemical properties is termed isomerism. Now, we we'll consider structural isomerism. In this case, the compounds have the same molecular formula but different structural formula. These compounds are called or referred to as structural isomers. Butane, for instance, can have the structural isomers of butane and 2 methylpropane Pentane has three isomers, which is N-pentane, 2-methylbutane, and 2,2-dimethylpropane. So the next form of isomerism we are going to talk about is geometric isomerism. This is a form of isomerism which exists between compounds with the same structural formula, arising because of their relative inability to rotate about double bonds or a ring structure. The emphasis of geometric isomerism is that it occurs mostly where you have a double bond. Now, the types of geometric isomerism include your trans geometric isomerism and your cis geometric isomerism. In the case of your trans, if you notice, this is one of the bonds, this is the second bond. On one side of the bond, you have different substances, but in cis, you have the same thing on one side, the same thing on one side. But once it is trans, you have different substances on either of the sides. In cis, you have the same on both of the sides. But in trans, once you have different substances on either of the sides, it is referred to as trans. So this is going to be trans 1,2-dichloroethane, 
this is cis 1 2 dichloro 18 because chloro is on the same side in the case of trans but 2 e the methyl group and hydrogen are different and on their one side so trans cis the hydrogen and hydrogen are on the same side so that is going to be cis we go to the next one which is optical isomerism optical isomerism is a form of isomerism in which the compound with the same molecular formula assumes different configurations when encountered by light so basically the plane of a polarized light is turned to the left or to the right and that is what we refer to as optical isomerism generally speaking when the plane is turned towards the right it is dextro rotatory or when it is turned towards the left it is level rotatory with this said we would get into calculation of isomers we will simply just consider the number of isomers in the first 20 members of the alkane family so for methane you have one isomer for ethane you have one isomer for propane one for butane you have two pentane you have three um hexane you have five now for your jam exam the emphasis is on the first three the first three isomers of substances that can exhibit isomerism are your butane your pentane and your hexane and that is two three five those are the ones you need to know for your jam exam you can actually study the rest later on your own now with this said we move into the test for your classes of hydrocarbons now what is the test for unsaturation unsaturated hydrocarbons decolorize bromine or bromine water on mixing together so this is one of the most characteristic properties or tests once you are dealing with your hydrocarbons they have the ability to decolorize the bromine water they change the color from brown to colorless basically that's what happens now the next one is that unsaturated hydrocarbons also decolorize purple color of acidified potassium tetraozomanganate 7 so once you are dealing with an alkene or an alkyne and you introduce it to bromine water or to purple acidified potassium permanganate the implication is that it is going to decolorize it but if you introduce alkene there will be no reaction so that's that basically to test for unsaturation now to distinguish between an ethene and an ethyne, what we are going to do is to pass it through an aqueous ammonical solution of copper 1 chloride or silver 1 chloride at room temperature. Ethyne produces a reddish brown precipitate of copper 1 acetylide or silver 1 acetylide while ethene does not undergo this reaction. So mind you, if since the two of them are both unsaturated, if we are going to differentiate between the two of them, all we need to do is pass it through the ammonical solution of copper 1 chloride or silver nitrate. Once that happens, for a time, a time will react, but a team will not react, hence differentiating the two of them. When a time is reacting, it is going to give reddish colored copper 1 acetylide for your uh, a time reaction, but in the case of a team, there will be no reaction so let's get into the formation of crude oil petroleum is formed in deep sedimentary beds from animals and vegetable debris as a result of their bacterial decomposition under pressure the petroleum being less dense than the surrounding water then gets expelled from the source bed and migrates upwards through porous rocks until it finally blocked by non-porous rocks such as your shale or dense limestones. In this way, petroleum deposits become trapped by geological features caused by the folding, faulting, and erosion of the earth crust. Now let's get into refining petroleum. Refining simply refers to the separation of useful products such as petrol kerosene from crude oil. This is done in petroleum refinery by a technique called fractional distillation. This basically involves taking advantage of the boiling point ranges or the different fractions using a fractionating column. So we'll just consider a few of them. The natural gas is made up of 1 to 4 carbon atoms and it distillates at a temperature greater than 20 degrees Celsius. Use this is basically that it is used as an industrial or domestic fuels. Like for instance, the cooking gas, as we know, is a mixture of your propane and butane. And that is used for cooking it is falls under your natural gases you have your butane which is a major part of your natural gas butane is used as an industrial fuel for most industrial processes which require production
production of heat. Then you have your petroleum ether, which ranges from uh, five to six carbon atoms. This particular petroleum ether uh, is distillated at a temperature of 30 to 60 degrees. Talking about the uses, it is used as an organic solvent. You have your naphtha, which contains about seven to eight carbon atoms and is also an organic solvent distillating at 60 to 90 degrees. Then you have your gasoline. This one we Nigerians call fuel. It's not fuel. It's your gasoline or petrol. It basically has 6 to 12 carbon atoms and it distillates at a temperature of 75 to 200 degrees Celsius. It serves as your fuel for your vehicles and solvent of paints and grease. Kerosene, which is used in our lanterns, our kerosene lanterns, contains 12 to 18 carbon atoms and distillates at 300 to 300, 200 to 300 degrees Celsius. Uh, it is used for lightening and heating our kerosene stoves, kerosene lamps, we use them as fuels in those things. So the next one we are going to consider is your light gas oil or diesel oil. Diesel oil or light gas oil has 12 to 25 carbon atoms and the boiling point or distillating boil temperature is about 300 to 400 degrees Celsius. It is used as a raw material for cracking process and also serves as fuel for your diesel engines. Then we talk about your lubricating oil. The lubricating oil has 25 to 35 carbon atoms and distillates above 500 degrees Celsius. Uh, it is basically used for your production of your engine oils and when you uh, redistillate it, it can be used for production of your petroleum jelly. That's what we refer to as the Vaseline. The next part of the study that we are going to get into are your alkanons. Now, alkanons are organic compounds formed when a hydroxyl group gets linked to an alkyl group. So, every alkanol contains at least one hydroxyl group as a functional group. So, the implication is that once you are considering the structure of an alkanol, it is characterized by the presence of a hydroxyl group. And the hydroxyl group is OH. You just have that. that once you have OH linked to an alkyl group, Automatically, that is an alkanol. Having said this, what are the things that must be noted about the alkanol? It has a general molecular formula of CN H2N plus 1 OH. So, mind you, that once you notice it has a general molecular formula, it means that we can use this thing to form or get the formulas of every other alkanol. Number note, this is what we refer to as a monohydric alkanol. Why is this monohydric? Because it contains only one OH. It's quite simple to understand. So moving ahead, if I want to look for an alkanol that has 17 carbon atoms, that will be C17, H2 times 17, plus 1 OH. And that is going to give me C17, H2 times 17 is 34 plus 1, that's 35, and then I have OH. So that's that basically. So this is your heptadecanol, basically the chemical formula of your hepta. So, with that said, we go back to our slide. So, moving back to our slide, you will notice that this is an illustration of the link between an alkane, an alkyl, and an alkanol. So, we remove one hydrogen, you form the alkyl, attach OH, it becomes alkanol. So, basically, that's what's happening here. Okay, now, the process of removing a hydrogen atom from an alkane is basically known as dehydrogenation. Let's consider the classes of an alkanol. Alkanols can either be monohydric or polyhydric. When you say an alkanol is monohydric, it means that it contains only one hydroxyl group. On the other hand, if it is polyhydric, it contains more than one hydroxyl group. This monohydric alkanol is further classified into primary, secondary, and tertiary. To understand this fully, you would need to understand the classes of carbon. So, let's consider the classes of carbon. If you have a list of carbon atoms in the chain, Let's say we have this. Uh, yeah. So let's give them numbers or allocate numbers to them. This is carbon 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6, 7, and 8. If you are asked to classify these carbon atoms, it's quite simple. Classification of carbon atom is based on the number of carbon atoms directly linked to them. So let's get to it. There are four classes. The first one is primary carbon atom. A primary carbon atom has only one carbon directly attached to it. So one carbon direct attachment. So one carbon atom directly attached. So if I am looking at a, a primary carbon atom, 
The first thing I need to take note of is that it has only one carbon directly attached to it. And then secondly is that every primary carbon atom is terminal. That is to say, it is the last carbon atom in the chain. So let's consider this. If you notice the terminal carbon atoms here, this is primary because it is the last carbon and then it only has an attachment to one carbon atom. C62 is the last from this end, so it is also primary and it's directly attached to only one carbon, which is C2. C7 is also primary, C5 is also primary, and C8 is also primary. So once you are considering your primary carbon atoms, they are terminal carbon atoms that are directly attached to only one carbon atom in the chain. Moving ahead, you have your secondary carbon atom. So your secondary carbon atoms are basically carbon atoms that are attached to only two carbon atoms directly in the chain. So once they are directly attached to only two, directly attached to only two, they become secondary. So if you look at your chain, this guy is not secondary, but C4 is secondary. Why is C4 secondary? It has an attachment to carbon three and carbon five, so two. If it is three, if it's directly attached to three carbon atoms, it becomes tertiary. So notice this, that C2 is going to be the tertiary guy because it's attached to three carbon atoms. Then finally, if it is directly attached to four carbon atoms in the chain, it is now referred to as quaternary. So that's that basic. So if you are considering your classes of carbon, primary has one carbon direct attachment, secondary has two carbon direct attachment, tertiary has three carbon, and quaternary has four. So remember and note that I said the number of carbon atoms is what determines the classes. With this said, we get into using this understanding to classify your monohydric alkanols. If the hydroxyl group is attached to primary carbon atom, it is referred to as a primary alkanol. So look, if you have this structure and I attach OH here, automatically this is primary. Why? Because the hydroxyl group is attached to a primary carbon atom, it becomes a primary alkanol. On the other hand, if I have this same structure, but I have the OH attached here, notice that this is a secondary carbon atom. Why is it secondary? Because it's attached directly to only two carbon atoms. Hence, this is going to become a secondary alkanol. If I have another structure, and in this other structure, I attach the hydroxyl group to a tertiary carbon atom. Remember, tertiary has three carbon atoms attached to it. It becomes a tertiary alkanol. So I take it again. Primary alkanols have hydroxyl group attached to primary carbon. Secondary alkanols have hydroxyl group attached to secondary carbon. While tertiary alkanols have hydroxyl group attached to secondary carbon atom. So uh, a primary carbon atom has only one carbon direct attachment. A secondary has two carbon attached to it. While a tertiary has three carbon atoms attached to it. So when the OH is attached to tertiary, it becomes tertiary. If it's attached to secondary, it becomes secondary. And when it's attached to primary, it becomes primary. So that's that basically about your classes of alkanols. Um, and as I said, the monohydric alkanols are classified into primary, secondary, and tertiary. With that said, um, I will give you another trick to know how to identify a primary, secondary, and tertiary alkanol, just based on the name. Now, if you see the name of an organic compound, and you notice that in that name, the alkanol is mentioned without any locant. When I say a locant, a locant is simply a serial number that indicates position. So once there is no locant indicated, like they just mentioned methanol, ethanol, butanol, icosanol, or just mention the name without a locant for the alkanol or hydroxyl group, it means that it is primary. So primary alkanols do not have locants before all. Now, even if they are supposed to have locants, the locant will be one. So take note of that. Primary alkanols do not have locants. So when I write something like uh, two, four, trimethyl, trimethyl pentanol. Notice that there is no locant. There is no serial number before the all. Hence, it is primary. Not minding the number of alkyl groups that are called as prefixes. The point is that once there is no number before all, looking at the name, it indicates primary. Now. If I want to know a secondary alkanol using the name, all I need to do is, if I consider the name, in most cases, it is going to have a locant before or. So, once you are dealing with a secondary alkanol, it usually has a locant. That locant must not be two. It can be pentan, three, or it can be anything. The point is, once it has a locant before or, suspects that it is secondary. Now, why did I say you should suspect? 
because tertiary alkanols also have locants before all. But look at the difference. If I have this to be 2 methyl penta 3 O, this is secondary. But if it becomes 3 methyl pentan 3 O, it becomes tertiary. So let me give you the trick here. If the alkyl group, the locant of the alkyl group and the locant of the all are the same thing, it is tertiary. But once the locant of the all and the locant of the alkyl group are not the same thing, it is secondary. So just have that in mind. Primary alkanols will have no locants before the all. Secondary alkanols will have a locant. But that locant must not be the same thing with the locant of any alkyl group as a prefix. And finally, your tertiary alkanols will have the same locant as the locant of the all. That is, the locant of the alkanol or hydroxyl group would be exactly the same thing as the locant of the alkyl group. So if I write something like this, and I say I have, let's say I have um, three methyl, three methyl decan, two all. Obviously, this is not tertiary, it is secondary. I told you once there's a number before the all, it's secondary. But to confirm if it is tertiary, the number before the all must be the same thing as the number of the alkyl group. If I have something like uh, 3 ethyl decan, 3 all, because the locants are now the same, automatically this is going to be tertiary. So you have that. These are just basic tricks that could help you when you are trying to identify. Your primary, secondary, and tertiary alkanols. Now, these alkanols have different type of reactions, and that's why you should be able to take note of them. For instance, when your primary alkanols is oxidized, it will give alkanols, and then eventually give alkanoic acid. In the case of the secondary, if it is oxidized, it will simply give your alkanones. And then finally, your tertiary alkanols do not undergo any form of oxidation. So it's important you know how to identify them. So that when you see them in a reaction, it's easy for you to be able to understand those reactions without any difficulties. Okay, so as we said, a polyhydric alkanol, poly, the term poly implies more than one, which means it should have more than one hydroxyl group per molecule. And that's that basically about a polyhydric alkanol. The popular polyhydric alkanols are your ethylene glycol which is your ethan 1 2 diol and then your glycerol which is your propan 1 2 3 triol properties of alkanols physical properties the first thing is that lower members are usually colorless with distinctive odor and a burning taste so when you consider your ethanol for instance which is a major constituent of our beers and alcoholic drinks you have that it has a distinctive odor and a burning taste solubility lower members are highly soluble due to the presence of hydroxyl group but solubility decreases as the homologous series ascends. So that means as the number of carbon atoms increases, the solubility of alcohols tend to decrease. Melting point. The simpler alkanols have lower melting points and their boiling points uh, are considerably higher than those of alkanes because of the presence of hydrogen bonding between the hydroxyl group. What then are the chemical properties of an alkanol? The first chemical property is that hydrogen atoms of hydroxyl group of alkanols are liberated by strong electropositive metals so which means alkanols are more like acidic this OH here is not hydroxide it is not ionizable the only thing that can actually live in this OH is hydrogen which means that alkanols are more acidic because they can donate hydrogen however it's important to note that this is a characteristic reaction to alkanols they have the ability to react with highly electropositive metals to liberate hydrogen gas Moving on to the next reaction, you have that the hydration of ethanol with corn H2SO4 will lead to the production of ethene. So if you remove a molecule of water from ethanol, you get your ethene. And this is basically the lab preparation of ethene. Let's consider that reaction. Imagine, for instance, you have a situation where, um, see, I prefer to apply it like, look at the structures individually. So you have OH. Remember that dehydration is removal of water. And when you are removing water, you remove water from an alkanol in the form of hydrogen and hydroxyl. When you remove it, these two bonds will now be free and then they will now join together. And when they join together, they will form the ethene, as in this case. 
So you have that sulfuric acid is the catalyst, and when this reaction occurs, it leads to an increase in saturation. This process is known as dehydration. Why? Because we are removing a molecule of water from the substance. Okay. So moving on, the next um, case is where you use excess ethanol. Now note, in the case of production of ethene, your acid has to be in excess. But when your ethanol is in excess, it would lead to the production of an ether. The ether in this case is ethoxy ethane. So take note of that. The next set of reaction that we are going to be considering is the esterification reaction. Esterification reaction is basically a reaction between an alkanol and an alkanoic acid. And this reaction will lead to the production of an ester and water as the only products of the reaction. Now, it's a very simple process. Easy to understand reaction. Remember that an alkanol is alkyl group attached to OH. And your alkanoic acid is alkyl group attached to COOH. Now, let's call this R prime to differentiate them. Now, in this reaction, what basically happens is that this particular R would find its way to hydrogen and replace hydrogen, while hydrogen then combines with OH. Note, the alkyl of the alkanol moves to replace the hydrogen in the alkanoic acid. Hence, we are going to have that the product would be RCOOH. Remember this R prime. And then this R will now move from here and attach itself here. However, you would have that when the hydroxyl combines with the hydrogen, it will now form water. This is the alkanol. This is the alkanoic acid. And this is the ester. So if we are to take this, we are going to find out that this is also water. Everybody knows that this is water. So if we have a reaction, let's say we have methanol reacting with methanoic acid what is going to be produced here is this ch3 will replace this hydrogen here and that's going to be hcoo instead of h we'll have ch3 then plus water formed h2 so if we are to name this usually when you are naming your esters they are named as alkyl alkanoids alkyl alkanoid this is the alkyl and this is the alkanoid So the implication, this is also, this is named first, and this is named second. So if we are to name this, we have alkyl with one carbon, so this is methyl. And then this is an alkanoid with one carbon, so this is going to be methanoid. Now we don't say methanoid, methyl, this comes first, this comes second. So the name is going to be methyl methanoid. So we just have that in mind. And that is basically the principle behind this particular um, reaction known as esterification reaction okay so moving on um that's that basically about the esterification reaction to produce esters not ethers please that's the typographical error is ethers okay you could try out some other reactions ethanol and ethanoic acid gives a tail ethanoid and the rest of them now Oxidation of alkanols is one of the things that is used to differentiate your primary, secondary, and tertiary alkanols. I have mentioned this, and I'm going to mention it again, that if you are dealing with your primary alkanols, your primary alkanols are alkanols in which OH is attached to primary carbon atom, and um, by their names, they will not have any locants before all. So, when primary alkanols are oxidized, so put this down, primary alkanols when they are oxidized they are first partially oxidized to form corresponding alkanals corresponding alkanals and then finally when they are completely oxidized they will give corresponding alkanoic acids so see how it works if ethanol, which is a primary, you are not seeing any number before all, so it's primary. If ethanol is partially oxidized, it is going to give ethanol. And then this ethanol will now be completely oxidized to give ethanoic acid. 
So just have that in mind. Okay. In the case where you have a secondary alkanol, when a secondary alkanol, secondary alkanol is oxidized, it oxidizes to give only one product, and that product is corresponding alkanol. Alka. No. So see what happens here. If, for instance, you have, let's say you have propan 2 or did you notice that there's a locant before the all? And because of this locant, it is secondary. The only time it becomes tertiary is when this locant and an alkyl group have the same value. Once they are the same, you now suspect or say that it is tertiary. So when propan 2 all is oxidized as a secondary alkanol, it will give corresponding alkanol, which means it's going to give propan 2 O. Quite simple. If you have something like your pentan 3 all. If it is being oxidized, it is going to give pentan 3 ohm, and that's that. Then finally, you have your tertiary alkanols. Tertiary alkanols. When your tertiary alkanols are oxidized, there is no reaction. So if you are giving a reaction and they say 3 methyl pentan 3 or notice that the 3. Three are the same thing for the alkyl. Please, not any just any substituent. Alkyl specifically, and your um, um, your all have the same locants. Automatically, if it is oxidized, the implication is that there will be no reaction. So that's that basically about the oxidation of alkanols. Now, the oxidizing agents for alkanols would be your acidified KMnO4 or acidified K2Cl. To 07. Basically, any one of these is basically used for its oxidation. Okay, moving ahead. Um, we would now get into uh, the iodoform reaction. The iodoform reaction is one of the characteristics, characteristic reactions of alkanols. Whenever alkanol and ethanol specifically is mixed with a few crystals of iodine, in the presence of your washing soda that is your sodium carbonate it is then heated to give a pale yellow crystal of triiodomethane triiodomethane is your iodoform which has the characteristic antiseptic smell just have that in mind that the ability to produce iodoform is one of the characteristic reactions of alkanols so have that in mind but then not all alkanols have the ability to do this reaction um, the only alkanol that has the ability to perform this reaction is ethanol. So note that ethanol is the only alkanol in this group that undergoes iodoform reaction. So where you heat iodine with washing soda and ethanol, mixing it together and heating it to a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius to give a yellow crystal of triiodomethane. Triiodomethane has a characteristic antiseptic smell. With this said, we are now going to consider the different ways of producing ethanol. The first method is by fermentation. Generally speaking, ethanol is produced by from sugar. The general molecular formula for your mono. So generally speaking, ethanol is produced by fermentation of glucose. So uh, if you are given a carbohydrate and you are expected to use to form ethanol, the first thing you need to do is to break that carbohydrate down to glucose. Consider starch, for instance. When starch is digested, it will be first digested to maltose and dextrose. Then the maltose is now going to give glucose. And then when the glucose is produced, if you introduce the enzyme zymase, it is going to break down this glucose to form ethanol. And this process is fermentation. In this case, this is a hydration reaction hydrolysis i meant to say hydrolysis process or uh, yes digestive hydrolysis this is also hydrolysis so when this occurs basically glucose is produced and then glucose is now fermented to give your ethanol so generally speaking once glucose is fermented it produces ethanol that is one major way of producing ethanol now um if as i said if you are considering starch all you need to do is to break down the starch first to get your maltose by hydration then you convert your maltose to glucose 
and then your glucose is then converted to ethanol basically and it also gives you so the general principle behind this is break down whatever carbohydrates you are giving to the glucose form and then ferment the glucose and automatically ethanol is produced so in the case of using your sugarcane which consists of majorly sucrose sucrose is broken down to give glucose plus fructose then the glucose is now fermented by zymes to give ethanol so um the solution obtained is subject to fractional distillation to obtain a fraction containing 95.6 percent ethanol this could further be dehydrated to give an absolute ethanol absolute ethanol has a purity of 99.5 ethanol and what is used for this dehydration process is calcium oxide the next thing we are going to consider is how do we produce methanol methanol is produced by heating a mixture of hydrogen and carbon 2 oxide at about 300 degrees celsius to 400 degrees celsius in the presence of chromium 3 oxide zinc oxide as catalyst under 200 atm so if i combine directly carbon 2 oxide and hydrogen i'm going to get methanol what then are the uses of alphanols if you consider the uses of methanol it is used as a solvent it is used in the production of organic chemicals it is used as foil in aircraft engines and for making methylated spirits on the other hand ethanol is used as an organic chemical for the production of other organic compounds such as ethanoic acid and ether as well as ethene as we saw in the reactions above it serves as a constituent of drinks such as beers wine and is used uh, for pre preservation of specimen and food substances glycerol is used for making dynamite making shoe polish and also for cream now what physical phenomena are associated with alcohols the first one is the white appearance of fresh palm wine is simply as a result of the suspension of the yeast as i mentioned that when you are considering your ethanol production the glucose in the palm wine would actually be fermented by yeast how are they going to be fermented the yeast will tend to produce the enzyme known as zymase and this zymase enzyme will now ferment the glucose to produce ethanol fresh palm wine should not be kept or transported in sealed container because of the tendency of the container to explode due to large volume of carbon dioxide so you notice this that whenever you are considering the conversion when glucose is fermented if glucose is to be fermented by your zymase it is going to give ethanol c2h5oh and then also produce co2 if you now put let's say the palm wine is inside a closed container there would be a constant build up of co2 and as the pressure increases it could eventually lead to the explosion of your sealed container so that's why it's preferable to leave your palm wine in kegs that are not completely sealed or closed why the yeast produces zymase and the zymase will now act to ferment the glucose to produce ethanol and carbon dioxide a build up of that carbon dioxide gas will lead to the explosion due to high pressure palm wine has a sweet taste because of the high content of unfermented sugar when fresh milk is left standing for a long time Hydrolysis occurs in the presence of bacteria called Bacilla acidipacti to form lactic acid, which is responsible for the sour taste of the milk. Fresh palm wine um, goes sour when left for a long time due to the production of ethanoic acid by bacterial oxidation of ethanol. So as I mentioned initially, I told us that when you are dealing with the oxidation of your primary alkanol, you get your corresponding alkanoic acid. And that implies that if ethanol is oxidized, it will give ethanol. And then when ethanol is now further oxidized, you will get your ethanoic acid. So take that in mind or have that in mind that primary alkanols are oxidized to form alkanoic acid after complete oxidation. So that's the case here. Phenols are compounds sometimes called phenolates. These compounds consist of hydroxyl group bonded directly to an aromatic hydrocarbon. The simplest of the class of phenols is your C6H5OH and is also called your hydroxybenzene. The acidity of phenol is very weak but are more acidic than alkanols due to the stable phenoxide that is formed. So as I mentioned before, 
One of the characteristic things about the alkanon or the hydroxyl group is that it has the tendency to lose the hydrogen associated with the OH. So when it loses this particular hydrogen, the implication is that it becomes acidic. The point about this is that phenol is actually more acidic than other alkanons, even though it is not a strong acid. The hydroxyl group of phenol is not bonded to a saturated carbon atom, unlike the alkanons. And because of that, they have high acidity due to strong attachment between the atomic ring and oxygen. So, properties of phenol. It is soluble in organic solvents such as ether and ethanol. It is also soluble in water due to the presence of hydrogen bond between hydrogen and oxygen atom. It is corrosive and poisonous. So, mind you, <laughs> do not go about drinking what it is also used for making nylon. It is used an, as an insecticide for dyes, explosives, disinfectants, and it could be used as an organic solvent. The next class of organic compounds that we're going to be considering are your alkanoic acids. Now, the alkanoic acids are basically characterized by the functional group called the carboxyl or carboxylic group. This carboxyl or carboxylic group is made up of the carbonyl group which is C double bond O and the hydroxyl group joined together. So once you join these two things together, automatically what you get is your carboxylic or carboxyl group. So mind you that anytime we are referring to the functional group of your alkanoic acid, you are considering a particular structure which possesses COOH as you can see here. So once you notice this COOH, the implication is that it is representing your alkanoic acids. So with that said, R represents basically hydrogen or any alkyl group, and they have a functional group of the carboxylic group as I mentioned. Now, there are many ways to represent the carboxylic group. You can either represent the carboxylic group as, let's say, okay, let's take this out. So it's either you write it as C O O H or you write it as C O O H or you write it as C O alkanoic acids R is going to be C N H two N plus one C O O H. Now N in this case starts from zero so if you're looking at methanoic acid methanoic acid the end for this guy will have zero why because there's already one carbon atom here so you don't need to like methanoic has one carbon so since the carbon atom is already here it means that these ones will be zero so if you do that for methanoic acid it is going to be c zero h two times zero plus one uh which will now give us coh then it's going to be c zero is zero two times zero is zero zero plus one is one so we have that methanoic acid is h c o for metanoic acid so you have that basically so once you are considering your alkanoic acid the general molecular formula is cnh 2 plus 1 coh where the end value starts from zero that is because there is already a carbon atom as part of the name of the compound okay so moving ahead um the next monocarboxylic The next thing we're going to be considering are your dicarboxylic acids. <laughs> As you can see, dicarboxylic implies that it has two carboxylic groups. So once you have two carboxylic groups, your ethane dioic, for instance, or your propane dioic, that is what we refer to as your dicarboxylic. On the other hand, we have the aromatic acids. These are alkanoic acids with benzene rings attached to them. So once you have a carboxylic group attached to the benzene ring, then you have your aromatics. Example is your benzene carboxylic acid or your phenyl methanoic acid the general laboratory preparation of alkanoic acids is basically from your alkanols when you oxidize your primary alkanols you get corresponding um corresponding alkanoic acids so as i mentioned initially ethanol when it is oxidized by potassium heptaoxo from it six or potassium pyridoxo magnetic seven with your dilute sulfate acid sulfuric acid will give us your um, ethanoic acid so just take note of that that complete oxidation of your primary alkanols will give your alkanoic acid what are the physical properties 
The first three members of the series are liquids which are completely soluble in water due to the presence of hydrogen bond. So members from C4, C9 are also liquids and partially soluble in water, while higher members are solids and they are not soluble. There is an increase in the boiling point of the acid once the number of carbon atoms increases, which is general for most um, homologous series. The first three members have pungent odor, while butanoic acid has a rancid odor. So take note of that. What are the chemical properties of the acid? Your monocarboxylic acids act as weak monobasic acids. So just take note that once you are dealing with your alkanoic acid, it acts as an acid because it is an acid. Yes, it liberates one of the hydrogen ions, which is the hydrogen attached to the carboxylic group. So note that these other hydrogen atoms here are not ionizable. The only ionizable hydrogen ion is the one attached to the carboxylic group. Moving ahead, they liberate carbon-4 oxide from metallic triazole carbonate 4, uh, uh, basically that, so which means as an acid when they react with carbonate, salt they produce co2 also they react with bases to form salt and water as the only products of the reaction now ethanols react with alkanoic acids alkanols generally are meant to say react with alkanoic acids to form esters as i have described this is a process known as esterification reaction now if oxidation of a primary alkanol gives an alkanoic acid it means that a reduction of an alkanoic acid will give a primary alkanol. Hence, we have that reduction of your alkanoic acids would eventually give your alkanols. So, if I reduce ethanoic acid using your lithium tetrahydrido aluminate 3, it will give me ethanol. Propanoic acid being reduced will give propanol. Butanoic acid will give butanol and the rest of them. What then is the difference between neutralization reaction and esterification? First of all, is that esterification reaction is covalent in nature, while neutralization is ionic. The second one is that esterification reaction is slow, and for it to be fast, you will need to introduce sulfuric acid as a catalyst. On the other hand, neutralization reaction is really fast and spontaneous. The reaction of esterification is reversible, but neutralization reaction is irreversible. Ester and water is formed in esterification, but salt and water is formed in neutralization. Catalyst is necessary for the reaction to occur, while in the case of neutralization, there is no catalyst needed. What are our uses of alkanoic acids? Methanoic acid is used in dyeing, tanning, and coagulating rubber. Yes, ethanoic acid is used in coagulating of rubber latex too. Ethanoic acid is also used as a weak acid. And higher carboxylic acids are used in soap and detergent production. We now talk about our alkanoids, which are derivatives of alkanoic acid. Alkanoids are basically compound formed after an alkanoic acid reacts with an alkanol, and the process of forming this compound is known as esterification. The functional group of an alkanoid is what we refer to as the carboxylate. So instead of having COOH, we we'll have COO and an alkyl group, and that is basically the functional group of your alkanoid. With this said, what then are the physical properties of your alkanoid? They have a fruity sweet odor. They are soluble in organic solvents but insoluble in water. They are colorless neutral liquids. And then their chemical properties include that ethyl ethanoid is insoluble in sodium hydrogen trazocarbonate 4. Um, they do not decolorize bromine water because they are not unsaturated. However, hydrolysis of an alkanoid with mineral acid would yield ethanol and um, basically yield alkanol and an alkanoic acid. Remember, in the forward process, it is a dehydration reaction. But when it is going backward, it has to be hydration. I would write that reaction for us to see what I mean. Um, if you consider esterification, esterification basically is a reaction between an alkanol, so ROH, and an alkanoic acid to give ester and water. So notice that water is removed. So the forward reaction is dehydration. And that dehydration process is known as esterification, which means if I want to reverse it, I'll need to add this water back. The catalyst involved for the backward reaction is sulfuric acid. So note, if esterification gives ester and water, 
it means that hydrolysis would give alkanoic acid and alkanoid. So when I say ethyl ethanoid and I say that it is hydrolyzed using H2SO4, the product is going to be ethanoic acid and ethanol. So note that this ethyl is from alkanol while this ethanoid is from alkanoic acid which means if I have methyl methanoid and I hydrolyze it I'm going to have methyl is from alkanol so it's going to be methanol while methanoid is from the acid so it's going to be methanoic acid so that's that basically about the reactions of an ester okay so moving ahead the next thing we are going to be considering is the next reaction which is alkaline hydrolysis when you hydrolyze an ester uh, basically it leads to the production of soap but these esters that are hydrolyzed in these cases are your fats and oil your fats and oil are large esters and basically they have the backbone the glycerol backbone so once you are dealing with your alkaline hydrolysis of your fat and oil which are also esters it is a process known as saponification and it leads to the production of soup and glycerol not ethanol that's a type of glycerol okay so moving ahead um what then are the uses of alkanoids the use of alkanoids is that they are majorly used for flavoring of our food glues oil resins and paints because they have this fruity smell now let's get into fats and oil. Fats are solids at root temperature and are of animal origin, while oils are liquid at, are of plant origin. They are naturally occurring esters and are grouped as glycerides. Why you refer to them as glycerides is because they have what you refer to as a glycerol backbone. So to represent the reaction of esterification to produce fats, because fats are naturally occurring esters, it is a reaction between fatty acids. Fatty acids are basically alkanoic acids that have more than, let's say, 12 to 13 carbon atoms. So they have more than 12 carbon atoms, basically. So above 12, 13, 14, 15, down 20 something, or above that, basically, represents your fatty acids. Now, when they react with your glycerol, your glycerol is propan 1, 2, 3 triol. Propan 1, 2, 3 triol. So imagine a situation where OH and here CH2, OH. So basically, in this reaction, this hydrogen would actually replace or uh, collect hydroxy. Why this alkanoid end will replace? Since there are three hydroxy, you will need three of this for it to be complete. So when this reaction occurs, you have RCOO attached to CH2. You have another RCOO attached to CH in this case. Okay, joining. Then you have RCOO attached to CH2. Then you have three water molecules formed. So basically, this is a fat. So this is your alkanoic acid or your fatty acid. This is your fatty acid. This is your glycerol. And then this is your fat or your oil. And finally, water. So you notice that the forward process is an esterification reaction. But on the other hand, the backward process is a hydration reaction or hydrolysis reaction, I would preferably say. So moving ahead, haven't mentioned this. What else can we notice about this? They contain fatty acids such as your octadecanoic acid, your steric acid, your hexadecanoic acid, your palmitic acid, octadec nine enoic acid, which is your lake acid, and glycerol, as I mentioned. These can be classified as saturated. Now when you refer to something as saturated it simply implies that they have no double bond on the other hand they can also be classified as unsaturated when there is one or more double bond or triple bond moving ahead the next thing we are going to talk about are the chemical properties of fats and oil the first chemical property of fats is basically hydrogenation so liquid unsaturated oils harden and become saturated by addition of hydrogen across the double bonds in the unsaturated carbon chain of oils under the influence of finely divided iron at a temperature of 180 degrees Celsius. This is actually used in the production of margarine. So another catalyst that can be used in this case is nickel. So have that in mind. The hydrogenation is what hardens your liquid oil. 
The next important reaction we are going to consider is saponification. This is basically a process of hydrolyzing fats with caustic alkalis to yield propan 1 to 3 triol and then you have your soup. So, if you look at the reaction, whenever any fat and oil reacts with an alkalis, it is going to give soup and propan 1 to 3 triol. Moving ahead, the uses of fats include manufacture of soap by saponification, by making for making glycerol, for the production of margarine, used in the manufacture of paints and candle. What then is a detergent? Detergents are classified as soapy detergents and soapless detergents. Your soapy detergents are simply sodium or potassium salts of organic acid. Yes, the sodium soaps of organic acid are hard soaps, while the potassium salts of organic acids are soft soaps. Sodium salt of octadecanoic acid, which is your steric acid, um, basically forms a hard soap as we can see. While in the case of your palmitic acid salt, that is a potassium salt of your hexadecanoic acid, it is going to give you a soft soap. How then do we produce this soap? Local soap is prepared by burning palm fronds, wood or plantain husk to obtain the alkalis. The ash obtained is then dissolved in water and filtered. Finally, it is filtered and boiled with palm oil. And when you boil it, the alkalis reacts with it to give your soapy detergent. It should be noted that the soap is usually soft because of the wood ash contains mainly potassium ions, while black color of the soap is because of the ash used. Soapless detergents. These are sodium or potassium of sulfonated long chain hydrocarbons. The principles of manufacture basically involves manufacturing from long chains of alkenes, where N ranges from 12 to 20. The general formula of detergent is given as RSO3 minus Na. The steps. The first step, the first thing that you do in the production of your soapless detergent is the sulfonation of alkene. This involves the reaction between an alkene and sulfuric acid to give sulfonated alkene. Then after that, you begin to treat that sulfonated alkene with sodium hydroxide solution to obtain the sodium salt of the sulfonated alkene. Here you have this as your product. Note, the carbon chain and ionic group can be varied. Alkyl benzene sulfonated detergent is something that can also be formed. Every detergent has a tail, and that tail is a hydrocarbon end, and then the head is what we refer to as the ionic water-soluble head, which is SO4NA+, for your soapless detergent. In the case of your soapy detergent, you find out that the alkyl group becomes the long tail, which is insoluble and non-polar, while the head, which is made up of your carboxyl group and sodium metal or potassium metal, serves as the soluble ionic head. The hydrophilic end attracts water, hence are water soluble, while the hydrophobic end attracts oil, hence are oil soluble. This makes soap molecule create a kind of attraction between the water and the oil and forms a stable emulsion which can be washed away. Comparison between soapy and soapless detergent. Scum formation. Soapless detergents contain water soluble ions such as calcium, magnesium and ion 3. As such, they do not form scum, unlike soapy detergents. The surface area. Soapless detergents have large surface area, hence can enable water to spread and penetrate more fully over and through an article being washed. The surface area of soap is very much reduced. Then we talk about solubility. Soapless detergents are more soluble in water than soapy detergents. Okay. The next property is basically the acidic and alkaline condition. Soapless detergents can be used in both alkaline and acidic conditions, unlike soaps. Then we go into polymers. Polymers are large organic molecules made up from regularly repeating small chemical molecular units called monomers, which are linked together. The process of linking two or more monomers together to form a high molecular mass of compound is called polymerization. This particular compound that is formed is referred to as a polymer. The two major types of polymerization are your addition polymerization and your condensation polymerization. The addition polymerization is a type of polymerization in which the unsaturated units called monomers break their double bonds to form links such that the empirical formulas of both are the same thing. The other thing to note about addition polymerization is that there is no other, there is just one product formed. So once you have addition polymerization, you only have one product formed. 
But in the case of a condensation polymerization, it usually involves the removal of a molecule of water or ammonia. Hence, you would have multiple products, which is the polymer and water or ammonia. Another thing about addition polymerization is that it usually involves homogeneous um, monomers. That is to say, all the monomers involved in addition polymerization are usually just the same thing. So, when we are forming polyethene as a polymer from ethene, this is a typographical error. It's supposed to be ethene. You will find out that polyethene is formed from ethene, and that's that basically. When you want to form your polyvinyl chloride or polychloroethene, you are going to have to use your vinyl chloride as the monomer. If you want to form your polyphenylethene or polystyrene, basically you do that by combining your phenylethene and polymerizing it. Also your propenonitrile and the rest of them. In condensation polymerization, it occurs when monomers are linked by reaction in which small molecules of water or ammonia are eliminated, as I mentioned. Nylon 6,6 is formed by a combination of your hexan 16 diamine and your hexan diuric acid. Another name for hexan diuric acid is adipic acid. So when you think about nylon, the two monomers of nylon are your hexan 16 diamine and your adipic acid. On the other hand, terylene is formed by condensation of benzene 1 4 dicarboxylic acid, which is your terephthalic acid, and your ethan 1 2 diol, using acid as the catalyst. Natural and synthetic polymers. Your natural polymers are formed from plants and animals and they include carbohydrates such as starch and cellulose, protein and rubber. On the other hand, your synthetic polymers are plastics with the ability to be softened by heat and pressure and they can actually be molded into any desirable shape. Examples of such plastics include polythene, polypropene, polystyrene, terylene, perspex glass, bakelite and urea methanol. The first five examples are referred to as thermoplastics since they can be remolded under applied heat without breaking, while the other two are referred to as your thermosets because they cannot be remolded. Let's consider our natural rubber. This is basically a polymer of 2 methyl butan 1 3 diene. So have that in mind that the monomer of natural rubber is basically 2 methyl butan 1 3 diene otherwise known as isoprene. With that said, we will find out that rubber occurs as a sticky material and can be improved by a process called vulcanization, which involves the addition of controlled amount of sulfur to rubber. The sulfur cross-links the rubber molecules together at the double bonds, giving rise to a superior product. This results in the elasticity of the rubber and improves its strength and toughness. So, one of the major advantages of vulcanization using sulfur is that it makes it tough. Synthetic rubber include your poly neoprene, your styrene beta 1 3 diene, your thiocol, your poly beta 1 3 diene, and your poly 2 methyl propene. Then we move ahead. Polymeric amides. These are otherwise known as polyamides. They are polymers characterized by peptide linkage between the units. Examples are nylon and protein. So let's talk about protein. Proteins are organic compounds whose basic structural units are amino acids. So once you are asked the monomers of your protein, the monomers are amino acids. Amino acids are basically made up of a central carbon which is attached to an amine group, a carboxylic group, hydrogen, and then an alkyl group. From this structure, it could be seen that amino acids contain the amino group and carboxyl group. The peptide linkage is what is formed between amino acids whenever you are polymerizing. So just note that the peptide bond is what is formed in polymerization of amino acids to give protein. Let's discuss carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are basically compounds, organic compounds, which contain carbohydrogen and oxygen. With hydrogen and oxygen occurring in a ratio of 2 is to 1. The implication is that every carbohydrate must contain carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. But if you check the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen, it is going to be 2 is to 1. They are generally classified into simple and complex sugar, where your simple sugar includes your monosaccharides and your disaccharides. Examples of your monosaccharides include glucose, fructose, and your galactose. You will notice that glucose is an aldose because it has a terminal alkanal group, because it has a terminal carbonyl group, and because of this, they are also referred to as your aldose sugar. How do we prepare glucose? 
glucose is actually prepared by acidic hydrolysis of starch and basically acidic hydrolysis of starch is digestion the other way of preparing glucose is by photosynthesis where carbon dioxide and water is actually reacted in the presence of sunlight inside the chlorophyll to produce your glucose and oxygen the fructose is an isomer of glucose and they are referred to as ketoses because of the presence of the ketone group so when you have your non-terminal carbonyl group if you can see in this case c double bond to oxygen is non-terminal and in this case it is characterizing your it is characterizing your ketones basically which are your alkanones so in this case the form of isomerism that is occurring between glucose and fructose is what we refer to as functional isomerism now we go into your complex sugar your complex sugars are referred to as your polysaccharides and are condensation polymers of glucose examples include starch cellulose dextrin and glycogen before we leave that or move ahead into the study i would like to give us a list of disaccharides and the constituent glucose that produces them so disaccharides are formed by condensation of two monosaccharides so when glucose reacts with fructose it is going to lead to the production of sucrose and then the removal of water so in condensation it is simply a removal of dehydration reaction where water is removed so imagine you have C6H12OH-O6 plus fructose is also C6H12O6 what it is going to give first of all let's combine these carbon atoms on combining them what we are going to get is C12 but remember that we need to remove water so let's remove this water then after removing it carbonyl the hydrogen is going to be 24 but we have two hydrogen removed so what is going to remain is H22 there are six and six combining together it's going to be 12 but we removed one oxygen so it's going to remain 11 so you notice that when glucose reacts with fructose this is going to give us sucrose so this is sucrose your disaccharides basically have similar chemical formulas just as your monosaccharides hexo sugars specifically so if glucose reacts with fructose it gives sucrose if glucose reacts with glucose it gives maltose if glucose reacts with galactose it gives lactose which is your milk sugar so this is your normal sugar the sugar that we use basically and the sugar in sugar and cane this is the one sucrose maltose is basically the sugar that is found in your barley your wheat your malt and then finally lactose is your milk sugar with that said let's move ahead